We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mandry and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Welcome back, Tom. I know you're still a little bit under the weather, but he's pushing through, soldier that he is, and I want to make sure I do say, again, thank you very much to Lee Overstreet for filling in last week. That was very nice of him, as always, so thanks, Lee. Yeah, I was, uh, I had a big business trip last week that I had to do. I had to go to a training, uh, which was an all-day training for a group of people, and it was the first time I was working for a subcontracting for a guy. Mm-hmm. So it was very important. I do a very good job, and I like Sunday. I felt like garbage. Yeah. And then Monday, I didn't. My, my wife was like, "Sleep all day." I'm like, "Okay, well, I can do that." <laughs> and then, you know, Tuesday I woke up. I was like, "I think I'm gonna sleep all day again." Yep. But Tuesday I also needed to do um because I, th- I think we were supposed to do it Monday night last. We week, were gonna right? do it Monday night last week. That was the that wasn't plan gonna happen from the week. I went before. to bed at like eight o'clock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then Tuesday it was I had four three appointments that I had to go to, and I had to prepare for this, and I left on Wednesday, so I had to do my last minute preparations. You know, going through everything again. So I just didn't have the time or the energy. I'm still sick. I'm not really sick, but I will be coughing and sneezing. So I feel fine. Yes. I just sound awful. So those of you that forewarned sympathetic coughers or sneezers, <laughs> here it comes. And all that is also why episode 638, the audio only version posted on Monday instead of our normal Friday posting time, because Tom wasn't even back on Friday. So that no, was I got happen. back Friday at like 4 p.m. or something. And then uh, the weekend was just, yeah catching up on all the stuff. So apologies. like I walked in the house. My wife was like, yell at that child. I'm like, all right, I'm back. Yep. <laughs> settling right back in uh, apologies to uh well for to everyone who li- de- depends on the audio only version to get them through their weekend but uh especially to jeremy porter who was over there at axpona we we you know the mention was there in the youtube video <laughs> that was recorded but if you didn't watch youtube you didn't hear about porter acoustics in time to go visit him over at axpona in chicago so apologies for that but hey that's how things go with the way time works and uh yeah. there it is but we're back sorry about that that was but you you can blame me i i ah, i could have done it earlier. There's I just, no blame to go around. Things happen when they happen. Just, like, I didn't even think the word podcast until <laughs> Sunday night. And I was like, crap, I better get on this thing. <laughs> All right, this is AV Rant, the podcast that does answer your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. Mm-hmm. And go to www.avrant.com. Leave us a comment. Facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. YouTube.com slash avrant. Contact us directly. Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. I got like three new followers this week. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, whoever you are. <laughs> You're well, yours is a very easy Twitter to follow. You'll, uh, yeah. you'll never be inundated. You'll That's right. You don't have to worry about you want. getting, you know, weird, inappropriate pictures or political posts from me. <laughs> if I, you do, you know Tom's been hacked. Let him know. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I want to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, you have to support the podcast in some way. So one of the ways you can do that is going to patreon.com and signing up for a monthly donation. Every month you support the podcast by them taking money from you and giving it to us, at least most of it. Automatically. So we want to thank our 79 patrons over at patreon.com. Yeah, that's patreon.com slash avrantpodcast <laughs> if you'd like to sign up. Our 79 patrons over there, thank you so much for the financial support. And we should mention, uh, didn't have any new donors this week. As far as we know, we might we might be mixed up. Let us know. By all means, if you know that you like did something to support the podcast and we haven't said your name, let us know because we're not doing that intentionally. That's for darn sure. But yeah. uh, over at our website, avrant.com, go to the desktop version if you're on mobile because it won't show up on the regular mobile version scroll down to the bottom click desktop version or if you're already on a desktop over on the right hand side it says support av rant there's a little cup of coffee logo over there you click on that it'll take you to paypal you don't have to have a paypal account you can just use a credit card if you don't want to sign up with paypal and uh do a one-time donation that way so thanks to I anybody if i can hotkey this there's a mute hot button key? i never never really oh, knew yeah. that there was a mute button there should be a mute button i Microphone's press it right here button. and there we go mine is physical now oh. Could you still? Can you hear me right now? Can you hear me? I can me? hear you right now. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, why is the mute button doing that? It's recording. It's showing. Re- oh, it's yeah. stupid. Maybe it turns off the software recording part and not. No, the- I'm looking at the waveform. It's there. Oh, okay. Oh, I don't know. If this, if the audio doesn't come through, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> well, you should care technology. that something is recorded on your end. That that would be beneficial. That is, that's fine. It's being recorded. As far as I, I can, can still hear you on this. If if needs must, I'll just grab it off of the Google Hangout. No, no, later. it's recording. I, I press yeah. mute. I press unmute. I press all the buttons. Don't play with stuff, Tom. Bad things happen. That's not bad. <laughs> all right, in the news, uh, we've got details about Disney Plus, which, mm-hmm. by the way, I really don't want to sign up for, but I think I'm probably going to have oh, to, they which have, means... They have made a case. They I, <laughs> I mean, like DCU, I'm like... Oh, I don't care. That's pretty easy to ignore, honestly. That's honestly, there's not a lot there. Even like HBO, I'm like, nah, I mean, Game of Thrones is good. That's one but... where you could easily see yourself signing up for like a month or two, but not all year long. Right. You know? But uh, Disney Plus is really making a stupid case for this thing, which means I'm going to have to talk to my wife about it, which means that we're going to have to give up something else. And she's going to say Netflix mm. because she doesn't ever watch Netflix. Mm. The kids watch Netflix and I will occasionally watch Netflix these days. But I've been, uh, I just got through all on Hulu, all of the original Dragon Ball episodes. Yep. You know, the, the early, highly offensive ones. <laughs> <laughs> Racist misogynistic well that, i mean I just mean, like all the all the things that were wrong with that that could be wrong with that were hulu kind of ties into disney plus though as well since disney now owns a controlling stake in hulu so i know so uh, <sighs> yeah anyway, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> i'm trying i'm really trying not to cough so anyways disney plus the u.s launches november uh 12th so we've got some time to think about it mm-hmm. europe and asia in late 2019 early 2020 it's going to be about seven dollars a month or seventy dollars for a year yeah so i mean that's important seven dollars a month or seventy dollars for a year so basically two it's months like free if you pay for the whole year in advance three movies it's like buying three movies i mean this is entirely the like drug dealer type of push because it's like it's it's almost free to get you started, you know. It's like it's very enti- low low barrier to entry to get you in. It's like once they have everybody in, you know that price is going up, but then you're locked, you're stuck forever. Yeah. They know they're going to get you. So it's going to support uh, 4K HDR. The audio formats have not been specified as of yet. Mm. The apps are pretty much. Uh, for any streaming box you can think of because no one's saying no to Disney. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they even Lar- have a Nintendo Switch on there, which, like, what do they have? They have YouTube and what's it? They have one other. I think Hulu or something. It's like not what you would, it's not Netflix on the Nintendo Switch, but th- there it is, Disney Plus. They're like, yeah, we can get Nintendo on board. We're Disney. <laughs> yeah. So large headers for... Uh, Disney, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, and Nat Geo. There's not going to be any ads. The full back catalog of Disney Classics, the full Pixar catalog. Yep. Uh, moving forward, it will be the exclusive streaming service for all things Disney. So yep. any Marvel, any of that stuff is all Marvel, Star Marvel. Wars, all that. No, they have a couple of contracts already in place, uh, particularly with Netflix, where there's right. like a couple of movies that have to stay on that service for another year going forward, and Disney won't get the streaming rights for those back until that elapses. But it's only a year, as far as I know. I think like solo is stuck over there on netflix for another year <laughs> they won't be able to put solo a star wars story on at launch on disney plus uh and, but and the entire world wept for right. that but they did say like all pretty much all the disney classics i'm sure you will not find song of the south because as far as disney is concerned that movie pretty much never existed except for right. somehow everyone still knows the song zippity doodah i'm like how does everybody know that song even though the movie that it came from nobody can like find anywhere it's to watch but uh, pretty- racist i remember watching that one <laughs> that that's why they pretty the much say that boat and all exist. that stuff yeah it's not not, not the best i know dumbo's best. still out there with those crows so they they can they're yeah. still doing that but uh anyway again, i just watched dragon ball and uh <laughs> you know if anybody knows how to be a racist <laughs> the japanese as mentioned before oh yeah that racist in itself comment tom my goodness i know you threw that at me once i can throw it back at you even though what it's not actually true uh but yeah (laughs) no uh doing away with this disney vault right they're like uh they they said explicitly they're like once uh something is on the disney plus service they are not gonna take it off they said right. that. Uh, I'm sorry, right. like Netflix has stuff come and go all the time, not their own original content, but because they have contracts with other companies. But Disney is like, no, we own all this stuff, and if we put it on Disney Plus, we're not going to take it away. I mean, that's what they say now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who knows? We'll Policies see. are subject to change. I'm sure is somewhere in the user agreement. But uh, yeah, <coughs> they're, again, they're trying to get everybody to sign up for this thing. 
So we have the full backlog of Disney classics, the full Pixar catalog. Moving forward, the exclusive streaming service for all things Disney. I think I already said that. 30 seasons of The Simpsons at launch. <laughs> That's the Fox deal is in effect, and it'll be the exclusive place to stream The Simpsons, Disney+. Plus. Yeah. So they plan to expand Hulu to other countries. Disney mm-hmm. Plus will remember will remain, excuse me, family friendly. Hulu will be will there offer their non family friendly content, which is an interesting way of doing it. It but is because I mean, I, notice they don't have a Fox subsection on the Disney Plus. No, uh, no. I mean, it, obviously this can be added in the future. It's not like this thing is static. Stuff will be added all the time. But it right. seems like they're kind of leaning towards you know R rated content of that. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with Deadpool. You know, technically, it's gotta go on Hulu. It's technically, go that's Hulu. part of Marvel, but it's definitely R rated. It is not family friendly. <laughs> so. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting way of doing it. It is a hard gate between their family friendly stuff and their non family friendly right. stuff. And most of the time, I would be against it. Most of the time, I'd be like, "Wait, you're gonna make me pay twice so I can see Deadpool right. along with all the rest of the Marvel movies?" But Disney has a long history of, you know, this family friendly. Yeah, you know, I don't image that they have one that they want to maintain. Yeah. If they keep the price a reasonable level, because Hulu is only like seven dollars, eight dollars a month right. too. So between the two of them, you're paying Netflix. And they were saying they were definitely considering that they're not. They haven't announced it as official yet, but they're strongly considering the idea of having some sort of bundle, which is like Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus all bundled together, uh, all their major streaming services for one discounted price. So nothing official in that. But I mean, that seems uh, if they come out and say, "Oh yeah, we're strongly considering that," I think it's going to happen. You know, <laughs> so it seems like a no brainer to offer that at some point. I, got, I, I swear, I'm like the quintessential nerd. Like, I don't care about sports, like, mm. at all. <laughs> I, I I don't care. I've got friends who, who, you know, pay extra so they can get ESPN and they can watch all the games because of their colleges that they went to or whatever. And that's just that's just not me. I've never cared about watching sports. Like, I remember sitting there when my, the Super Bowl was on and my dad's watching it and it's like the 49ers and somebody, I can't remember. And the 49ers are, like, killing them. And I'm like... Because it was Joe Montana back in the day. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there with my Atari 2600 waiting to plug in the game that I just got. And my dad's like, well, we have to wait till the game's over. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, how much time is left? Two minutes. Well, as long as two minutes in the world is last two <laughs> minutes of the Super Bowl. Right? As, as long as they go. I'm just <laughs> miserable waiting for this game to end. And, you know, I just never, never really got it. I never really got it. So, you know, they're taking and bundling these two things together. I want them to bundle Hulu and Netflix and whatever. Oh, or Hulu ESPN. and Disney Plus. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's Disney Plus. I'm, right. I'm sure it'll happen, especially if they're going to be dividing family friendly and non family friendly this way. Uh, I'm sure they'll offer a bundle in the not too sort. distant future. Yeah. So, a bunch of original shows from all of their sub brands that will only be available on Disney Plus will also be there so yep uh shows. big one that they showed was the mandalorian which of course is part of the star wars universe well, they're supposed to have the the vision and and wanda and wanda vision, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and then uh, uh what's his name uh winter War soldier Machine? and uh somebody. falcon falcon yes falcon and winter soldier there was another one the loki it's gonna be a loki, loki show and i also heard war machine that might be in talks why about. not Honestly, dude, he is. I mean, and I think Don Cheadle has like sort of bulked up for this. Mm-hmm. But it, it, and I'm. This is just my my the, the few seconds he was in uh, uh, Infinity War. I'm like, his head looks too small. <laughs> his head looks too small for the rest of his body now, and it's he looks weird. Yeah, because he, he looks as, actually. It's like, like your grandpa trying to be a superhero. <laughs> he like you know? lost body fat but gained mass everywhere else. So yeah, yeah, his everywhere. Face but this slimmer while the rest he, of him got bigger. Yeah, it's very strange, and I don't mean that as an insult to him in any way. It could have just been the filming or anything else. They could do all kind of crazy things with with, with cameras and stuff, and it. You know, it, it the the perspective always makes a huge mm-hmm. difference. You can see that in like Justice League, how they change the colors of the backgrounds, and suddenly everybody's costumes look dumb. Yeah. So I mean, they could do some really interesting, you know, some really dramatic things with lighting and everything else. But I don't know, dude. Don Cheadle, I don't, I don't see it. But this Disney Plus service, I mean, I was, I don't like the. <laughs> It seems to me like clearly monopolistic intent. <laughs> like I, I don't like how compelling what they've announced is because I'm like, 
they did a really good job. I have to I have to hand it to them. They did a really compelling job of making their case of why you're going to spend if they $7 came out, every month. If they came out with this at 19.99 a month. Right. I still think that people would they would be a lot of people. Oh, many people that. would. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I would have an easier time saying no, but a lot of people especially you, you know, new parents, young parents, you know. And I mean, the thing their- is once they sign up 120 million people, uh, they probably will jack the price up. But yeah, <laughs> we'll see. 70 bucks for a year, man. Like, if you have kids, how do you say no? Honestly, how do you say I no? am a child, okay? <laughs> and I can't say no to seeing all of the Marvel movies, you know, as soon yeah, as you can see them on want, streaming. Yeah. I mean, we're going to talk about this later about going to movie theaters because yes. it's part of the questions here, but. That, I mean, $70 a month, that is essentially one time of us all going to the movies together. Yeah, 70 bucks a year, yeah. I yeah. mean, hopefully, a year. Yeah. hopefully yeah. the Marvel movies will actually be in 4K HDR because they won't allow that on iTunes. They're like, nope, yeah. we want a higher price tag if it's going to be 4K HDR. So you get 1080p SDR only over on iTunes. Like, we gotta grumble, grumble. So, but hey, it's their streaming service now. So hopefully the quality is well, better. The, too. the other thing that's not in the news here, we haven't talked about it, is the new trailer for Star Wars Episode 9, that which apparently has a, has a name now. Yes. The Rise of Skywalker? The Rise of Skywalker, which is interesting I, I because... did not see that coming. What Skywalkers are left in the canon, so... I don't know. If they make her into a Skywalker, I'm going to be super irritated. I don't think they're doing that. Some people are I don't thinking think so the either. idea is that, like, Skywalker will become a title. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe that's, uh, like, the Knights of Ren. Yeah. Or it'll be the Skywalkers or something like that. I don't yeah. know. Anyways, it's... It was a pretty... I mean, I'll tell you... It, 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 they're so formulaic these days with the, with the, with the trailers, trailers, but the freaking music gets me every time, right? The, <laughs> the, the, the rising music and stuff like that, like the little chills are going up the, the back of my neck. at and the I'm, front, then the oh. silence, followed by what's, what's that in the distance? What is yeah, that? And then it, it comes just, screaming at you. Yes, it's all very uh, compelling. It's all very compelling. I'm very <laughs> excited. And I'm going to say it again. I'm, I've said it before. I liked the last Star Wars movie. You liked the last I Jedi. think I did like the last. I think it's if they don't screw it up with this next movie, if they don't try to retcon the whole thing, which they might. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if they don't screw it up, I think that it's going to end up being viewed just like Empire Strikes Back as being Maybe? the best one of the trilogy of this trilogy. But we'll see. I have a lot of star. I have a friend who's like in the Star Wars troop. You know, where's the 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 Empire the, the stormtrooper. No, okay. I, he he traded in his he like sold all of his stormtrooper armor and got a general got a custom made General Grievous suit. Really? Wow. Yeah. General so he's Grievous. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I haven't seen him in it There's yet. There's a pull. But, uh, uh, I gotta actually talk to him because we'll probably get uh, tickets for uh, the last day at Christmas, like we did last every every year. There's been a Christmas one. Yeah. And uh, I'll have him deliver it in General Grievous's. Ah, yes. Well, I do like how all of the uh, horrible people on Twitter and online and Reddit and all that who are like, The Last Jedi was a terrible movie and Star Wars is dead to me now. I'm like, you sure made a lot of comments about this trailer for Star Wars being dead to you. Same people. Don't even get me started. (laughs) There's, uh, I I just, I am, I, 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 I keep telling my kids, I'm like, you know, a lot of these people who are online and doing this stuff, I'm hoping that they're going to all die. You know, that they're just old and they will die. Oh, they're not old. That they're not the old folks doing those comments. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just say, oh, you ruined my childhood. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> know who ruined your childhood? You did. You're yeah. a terrible child. I've met many children and they're all awful, especially my own. <laughs> nice. Don't get me started. All right, so in other news, mm-hmm. you can finally change your Sony uh, PSN ID on PlayStation. S- said no one caring well about i mean this ever. is something that has been requested for ever since psn came out the playstation network like came out because you know you choose your username and then you're like wait a sec wait, wait i'm locked into that that stupid joke pun name that i gave myself yeah. there's no way to change that people have been waiting for like decades for this but it breaks almost all of your existing game save uh <laughs> saves if you do and if you try to pick an offensive name it will now automatically be replaced by a temporary id yep so Good stuff. If you created a bunch of levels in Little Big Planet or something like that, say goodbye to those <laughs> if you want to change your name. Apparently, something in the back end has tied whatever you created. I feel zero your zero sympathy for people who have done this. Yeah, who made I'm a really honest. stupid name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I live with my username. I use the same username for everything, mm-hmm. and it's uh, a name that my brother used to call me when he was young. He's my autistic brother. 
couldn't say my name right, so he said something else, and that's what I use. Yep. I've been using it. It's 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 a email address I use. It's in my Gmail account. It's you know it's on everything. Every use every form I've ever been on, it's got the same name. Same with my first reflect name. What's like, I, yeah. I like that it's a it's an audio derived name from first reflections, and yeah. it seems to be available almost everywhere I go. I'm like, yay! I can still be first reflect. Oh yeah, I already reserved my name on uh, Harry Potter's Wizards, exactly. Wizards Unite. <laughs> I'm like, you're not getting that. That's mine. <laughs> now that I've said I, that, I might not be, even play it. There's going to be someone know. listening to this who's like, oh, I'm going to steal Rob's username now everywhere that I go. So I'm Dude, stuck. Get a life. Get a life, you you person. <laughs> you hypothetical straw you man. You straw man, man that we have just made up. <laughs> you internet troll straw man. All right, comments here. Uh, these are comments, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. from Rob in Australia. Rob's, uh, not this Rob, Rob in Australia. His setup includes an OPPO 203 connected to a Marantz SR6010, which then feeds both an LG6 C6 OLED and a 1080p projector. As a reminder, he had resorted to a physically plugging and unplugging HDMI cables so that only one of his displays was connected at a time. Otherwise, the 4K and HDR would never work on this OLED since this 1080p projector was apparently being detected even when it was powered off. Mm-hmm. So we suggested, and by we, we mean Rob, uh, Sewell's uh, IBIS Pro HDMI switch, since it just uses a physical button to connect this, this, uh, the single HDMI port on one side uh, to the two HDMI ports on the other side, having it shipped to Australia doubled the price, but it works. And Yay. this is a theme. If you live in Australia, your everything is doubled. Yep. The, the price for everything is doubled. because and I, It makes no sense to me. <laughs> I mean, all this crap is coming from China, and you go buy Australia on your way to everywhere else. So just drop it off. You know, just right. just pick a city and that drop easy. it off. <laughs> Send a little away away team off a huge container ship. Yeah, all these massive semi truck. No, but instead they gotta ship it all out. the way over to you know America, where Seal puts its little sticker on there, and then they send it on a plane, which yep. then drops it off on a humpback whale, which swims <laughs> it the rest of the way. So, anyways, with this new switch in place, the menu on this Oppo would flicker or even go black when he's using his OLED. So he tried switching an HDMI cable, and that improved matters, but was still with some occasional flickers. Determined to get it working, he bought new certified premium HDMI cables from Amazon, doubled the price of the ones he was using before, uh, and now no more flicker. The menu is stable, and movies play fine in HDR, uh, 4K, and all that. The Sewell switch and all that works great. The thing is, his old, cheaper HDMI cable said they were uh, certified premium, and they had uh, the little hologram sticker and everything. So just as a warning, even that might not be enough of a guarantee. <laughs> Finally, he's still having to power cycle his brands in order to get Dolby Vision discs to show up. Everything else is working nicely now, so that's his last hurdle. So the whole premium certified thing, I mean, it was supposed to be, if you have the proper hologram sticker and it's got the <coughs> QR code on there and you put your phone up to the QR code and it actually takes you to the official, yes, this is really a certified product website and all that stuff, it's supposed yeah. to be your guarantee that this thing will work with the full 18 gigabits per second spec. I mean, so the Oppo menu that's being output in 4K, at 60 frames per second, and that's why you need the full bandwidth. Uh, you know, your ones that are limited to 10.2 gigabits might not work. And he was getting this flickering or sometimes occasional cutting out. Uh, is sending it through a couple, like it's going out of the Oppo, into a Marantz, out of the Marantz, into this passive switch, out of the passive switch, into both of his displays. So it's a right. you know fairly long signal chain without a ton of boosting along the way, because that switch doesn't do <laughs> Any yeah, we don't really know if there's any sort of signal loss on the way too. That's right. I mean, the, with the yeah. switch, that would be what I would be concerned about. And I mean, you know, the switch loss. says it's full 18 gigabits per second and HDCP 2.2. I mean, it's just physically moving metal back and forth, so there should be no reason why it wouldn't pass anything. And it does. He got it working, but it is disconcerting that he had cables that were said they were certified premium and had the little sticker and everything, and they didn't work. But then other ones, more expensive ones that came from Amazon, did work just fine uh so i'm right. not i mean even the certified premium program it's not as though they're literally testing every single individual cable it is batch that's true testing. and there's there it is batch testing and there is a you know you pass a threshold and you pass yeah. you know they could you know the ones that you got could have barely passed but that's and right yeah. the uh, or they pass with the, with a few errors but not yeah you know, not enough to still, fail to fail right and then the the, the other ones you got passed Easily. Yeah. So yeah. you've got sort of, I don't want to call it headroom, but essentially you've got headroom 
in there yeah. for a little bit of signal loss you'll be okay uh that would be my guess yeah. i mean uh, that were just i mean honestly in australia when i was there there was stuff that looked straight up you know copied and you know fake <laughs> you, know, yeah, you exactly, go to stores yeah. it, it could be somebody just slapped a hologram sticker on there and called it certified premium but perhaps i think i think chances are especially when you get the menus which are at the full 60 hertz mm -hmm. and all that uh you know a little bit of dropout is probably considered okay <laughs> via you know whatever metric they're using uh I, I wouldn't be surprised if that that was what the case was but just a reminder if you're having those sort of problems uh Switching out your HDMI cables, unfortunately, might be a solution. It's tough. It's tough to troubleshoot, but right. um, yeah. Well, and this Keep is why we've mind. always hated HDMI. Yep. Not, it is because troubleshooting is such an issue. Yep. You know, with uh, component cables or any other type of analog cable, you plug it in, and if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, you know it's the cable. You could switch the cable very easily and, you know, from one side to the other or whatever, you know, the three cables that you had and get, you know, like, oh, well, you know, green and blue are working, but yellow doesn't seem to be working. Let me switch this cable. Oh, yeah, okay. It's definitely that that one cable. Uh, HDMI is, you know, you're <laughs> like, it could, could be the cable. It could be the handshake. It could be the, you know, the bandwidth. It could be all sorts of things. Nick, uh, for anyone who thinks Rob is crazy, and this is this Rob, not the other Rob, uh, for liking front wide speakers and being excited about monoprice monolith HTP1 and its 9.1.6 capabilities, there's a thread on AVS. Hey, when your backup for justifying something is AVS form threads, <laughs> not not bringing the most compelling evidence to the to the <laughs> table here, sir. Uh, detailing one forum member's 13.4.12 configuration. <laughs> Although the 12 overhead speakers are actually only eight Atmos overhead speakers plus four more overhead speakers dedicated to Aura 3D. Which mm -hmm. seems like a waste, but whatever. So he's not actually using all 12 <clears throat> overheads simultaneously. Uh, he's managed to do this using only two receivers mm. thanks to the capabilities of Denon's uh, X8500H. So that's much less expensive than a Trinov Altitude Pre-Pro, and despite being able to theoretically run his Atmos soundtracks as 13.4.8, he settled on 9.4.6. Oh, how will he ever survive? There you go. But uh, Well, interesting, though, that he did the experiment, installed all of these speakers, and he's like, you know what? 9.1.6, I mean, the point four. he's using four subwoofers, but it's one actual channel. So 9.1.6 right. is, like, uh, satisfactory. That's that's as much as he really feels he needs to do. I'm like, well, that's uh, that's what the <laughs> HTP one is gonna do for the same price as a processor alone as what the X eighty five hundred H goes for. Both of them are four thousand dollar devices. Although the X eighty five hundred H has thirteen amplifiers channel bu channels built into right, it, so right. it's different from the HTP one, which is a processor only. But uh, yeah, nine point one point six is uh, is where he settled after hearing what adding a whole bunch of extra speakers can do. So that's kind of interesting. And if you'd like to check out the whole thread, we'll have a link at avrant.com to take you to it don't comment in the don't in the avs forum thread <laughs> no good can come of it anaheim josh he's here we're going to the questions here mm -hmm. anaheim josh josh's house is a single level so there's no upstairs room to worry about as far as sound leakage goes so would we still recommend using backer boxes for his in-ceiling speakers if there's no concern about reducing how much sound leaks into the ceiling is there a worthwhile sonic benefit to having backer boxes uh don't only i mean so let's wait. Backer boxes will never hurt. Right. But in this case, the thing I would worry about is the sound going out into the the attic and then coming back down someplace else, you know, coming through someplace else, a light fixture yeah, it's or like something like that. Yeah, it's like a flanking path, right? You're allowing the right. air to move freely in the uh, whatever's above your ceiling, and then if you have other openings in your ceiling, the sound can come back down. But let's say that you've got, you've got, you know, light fixtures, but there's mm -hmm. insulation everywhere, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, like, as there normally is in attics. I would not worry about it at all. I would just have it. Well, know, the thing no is, I'm not even so much considering the sonic side of it. I'm considering the side that most places it is code that you have well, to have a back that. cam yeah. on anything yeah. that goes into an attic space. That's a fire safety code. Uh, and, and considering you're in California, almost certainly there is a code because they love yeah. them codes out there. California. Yeah. So uh, considering this is a single level, I have to assume what above uh, what is above your ceiling is your attic space, and you right. are most likely required by code to have a backer box. In fact, it has to be a fireproof back can on your in-ceiling speakers. So uh, that, to me, settles that. <laughs> when, you're, right. when you've got to have it to be in compliance with code, uh, whether it's a sonic benefit or not is kind of beside the point. Yeah. 
sonically i wouldn't worry about it but yeah right there's always that to be yeah i'm not tremendously concerned. concerned about the sonic side of this in this instance uh but very concerned about the fire safety code side of things all right, an update. Our recommendation as to which TV he should get has been the 75-inch Samsung Q8FN all along. But the newer Q80 or Q80 series just came out, so we was tempted by that. But we mentioned how the ultra viewing angle feature actually seems to make black levels and contrast worse than on the newer model. So we took a trip to Best Buy with the Magnolia department and had both the Q80 and the Q8 on display. The Q8 looked definitely better. Brighter better contrast, more details in the shadows. The salespeople even said that they're disappointed with the new Samsung models <laughs> because they knew that you were disappointed with it, so therefore they agree with you, and they're trying to sell you a TV, but good. I don't know about so, that. There's a lot of people in the earlier views who were like, mm, not yeah. so hype on this. <laughs> I, I, we're really going to start using the word hype. Okay. So, uh, just, I mean, that's fine. I can do it. I mean, I, I'm down with the <laughs> You're hype. Not required to. But it does seem like that's the direction this podcast is now suddenly going. We're going to be saying hype now. So that'll that'll definitely <laughs> I don't get us know where new. that came from. I'm that just saying. Away, but all right, language man. I'm just whatever. <laughs> I didn't realize we were saying hype now. We're just reaching out to the millennials, are we? That's our what? new thing. <laughs> I did not think about it. It just came out. <laughs> All right, it's fine. I mean, that, that's your generation. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll back you up, buddy. Uh, so, the, anyways, uh, so he picked up the, the 75 inch a Q8 FN, a wise recommendation. He says, and we're like, oh, there we go, because we are wise. Yay! And by we, I mean Rob. <laughs> so if. This latest uh, 2019 QLED uh, looks worse than the 2018 models. Do we think that the this indicates that maybe they've reached the limits of LCD TV quality? No. Oh, no. Uh, no. They, they will hey, always continue to improve. Let's all way. remember uh, Yamaha's receiver line right before the Avantage, where we all <laughs> went, holy crap, did they forget how to make receivers? <laughs> they suck. And then we hated them for like a year straight. And then they came out with Avantage. We're like, oh, my God, they're awesome. We love these guys again. So, yeah, everyone, every once in a while, they come out with some new technology and they decide to implement it. And they're like, somewhere down the line, somebody goes, eh, I don't think it's working like we thought it was going to. They're like, well, it's too late now. We'll yeah, fix it next year. It's interesting because this seems to be a theme this year, particularly with <coughs> Samsung and Sony where they have tried to get these wider viewing angles on their LCDs. They clearly read the criticisms of many reviews where they're like, well, this LCD TV looks good if you're bang on axis, but as soon as you move a little bit to the side, you know, the things wash right. out and you can clearly see the blooming and it, all that. So they're like, okay, let's right. try and get wider viewing angles to better compete with OLED's really wide viewing angles and just to make customers happy who say, hey, you know, I've got a living room set up. I have, you know, a couch that faces sideways. If I sit there, the TV looks horrible. Can you make a wider viewing angle? But in so doing and having to diffuse the light sideways, it means that the contrast level has gone down and, and the black level has raised up. Honestly, there, it, this is not a bad business decision either. I was mm. kind of making fun of it as being, you know, like they screwed up. But the reality is not that. The reality is there are people who are going to be in rooms that don't have light control. Exactly. Never watch in that sort of situation and need a wide viewing angle. And we're going to say, in that case, the Q80 is going to be better than the Q8. Sure. For that exact reason. And yeah, because it's still very, having very the, bright. But. And having that option out there is uh, not a bad thing for them. So it, it may be, first of all, th their their response is just like it should be any manufacturer's response, which is there's always going to be something to complain about. It's yeah. almost never do you have a perfect product that solves everybody's problems. Well, exactly. I mean, OLEDs perfect aren't perfect either. They're the people who exactly. complain about the burn-in or the slight, you know, non-uniformity like Lee Overstreet talked about last week. It's like, there's a little bit of non-uniformity even in bright white. I'm like, yep, yeah, there's that in LCDs too. So what's the alternative? <laughs> but, right, right. You know, it's, right. It, yeah, they're, they're not perfect any of these displays. Uh, but yeah, they, they've tried to address this one uh, shortcoming that some people right. were talking about. And in so doing, they've had to compromise in another performance area. They've basically made these vertically aligned panels that you know have the best black levels and contrast that lcd can offer at present uh made them look more like ips in plane switching panels that have wider viewing angles but not as good contrast so right. it's always a back and forth uh i mean we already know they have things like these dual lcd layer tvs where they have a back at black and white 
LCD layer that basically turns it into, you know, 8 million local dimming zones. And then that goes through a second LCD layer to put the color. And that is drastically improving black levels in contrast. Uh, so uh, that's another innovation that we might see come to consumer displays in the right. not too distant future. So yeah, LCD will continue to march forward. We haven't reached the pinnacle of its performance yet. Uh, and you know, this just happens to be a compromise year. That happens sometimes. Sometimes we hit particular years where we're like, I don't really like the models that this brand is making this year. So either get last year's or wait for 2020's models, you know? Right. They'll, they'll cap- and like I said, I mean, they are, and we, we've we said this in many different uh, uh, industries within AV, mm-hmm. which is, you know, they there's a problem, they solve it, and in doing so, they're neglecting something else. There's right. only so much you can do. You know, you got speakers that are like, we're trying to get really good, you know, deep bass. Mm-hmm. And they get deep bass and their troubles in the mid-range suffers because of it. Or imaging is not as good. Or, you know, you get bass bloat. Or you get everything else. But somebody's like, oh, I just want a, a, a speaker that plays loud and has a lot of bass. I'm mm-hmm. like, well, Sirwin Vegas for you, dude. You got it. <laughs> you know, you got it. Not for everybody, but it's for you. Dave on Twitter, based on recommendations, Dave got a five in, one out so HDMI switch that says it supports 18, full 18 gigabits per second in HTCP 2.2, and it works great. Yay, hey. problem solved. Next question. <laughs> oh, no, he's got more. But Dave has a ton of sources, and he needs even more 4K HDR capable HDMI inputs. Uh, Dude needs a new receiver, but whatever. Sewell has a newer Switch Deck 5 in one out model that lets you manually turn off the auto switching, and that would be nice. So he wants to use both, though, right? He wants both? He wants to continue using the one he already has and add another to his setup, yes. So he uses a Harmony Hub to control everything. So how likely is it that the older Switch Deck and the newer Switch Deck both use the same IR co- commands? He needs to be able to select just one HDMI source at a time, so he doesn't want both HDMI Switch Decks changing inputs when he uses the, or his remotes. Any ideas? Uh, okay, I don't know. I did not look it up because I knew Rob was. Oh, I'm not sure if we've completely lost Tom or if that's only on my end, but <laughs> things have dropped out here. So do they? Uh, so I'm not certain. Uh, I had a little dropout there with your uh, audio or your feed or something. So oh, not. maybe my mute finally cut kicked in. Uh, no, you completely froze on my end. But uh, yeah, no, I assume you're asking if the IR codes are the same. I don't know for 100% <coughs> certain, uh, but I think the likelihood is very high. Yeah, that's um, what I said too. So regardless, uh, I think there's a solution you can use here, which is that the Harmony Hub on the back of it, it does have two little expansion ports. As we yeah. were reminded, those are actually 2.5 millimeter ports, not 3.5 millimeter ports. So they're the even Very smaller small. uh, little plug, but they do offer optionally precision IR. Uh, I can't really call them blasters, but like uh, little, little uh, flashers. 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 Yeah. yeah. But the precision ones, the ones that are meant to only control one device at a time, yeah. and you have two optional outputs, you can connect these little precision IR cables to them. So with that, uh, you can tell in your Harmony setup software, you say, when I want to control this device, so you can say, I have Sewell switch deck number one and I have Sewell switch deck number two. When I want to control Sewell switch deck number one, right. don't put that out of the main blaster, only send it out of the precision port number one. And then when I want to control Sewell switch deck number two, only send those commands out of precision port number two. And then the commands will not cross pollinate and you just literally physically stick these little IR flashers onto the IR receiver of the device you want to control. And if you have a hard time finding the IR receiver, get a flashlight mm-hmm. and just shine it at the front panel or the panel. It's going to be in the front yeah. panel. But at, at wherever you think the IR blast, the IR receiver might be and look for like a red square. Yeah. And once or you see that... Sometimes. Sometimes circle and look for the little red reflection mm-hmm. in you know on the black panel because it's almost certainly going to be like a dark panel there. Yeah. And then that's where you stick it. You stick it right there. Yep. And if you're worried about cross pollination, which you, with the precision ones you shouldn't be, you can just put a little bit of electrical tape over the exactly. top of it, yeah. you know, just to make sure that no, you know, IR is leaking uh, or reflecting out the sides. All right, Brett. After Brett's mom saw his 65 inch B7 OLED in action, she decided to buy a 65 inch C8 OLED for herself because oh, she had to one, one up them. One up them him with the the higher number. She just dropped it on the table, but she's like, what up, boss? I'm your mom. I got you beat. Who's got the money? I got the money. What you got? Bills, boy. Uh, anyways, you know, I'm sorry. Hype. 
<laughs> uh, so she already had a, a recessed electrical outlet installed where she would like to mount the TV, and a three-quarter inch conduit was already run uh, has already been run inside the wall. If she wants to add uh, additional sources for the time being, she doesn't intend to use any external sources, just the built-in streaming apps. And Brett will be going over later this month to help her mount it and make sure everything's set up correctly. With the, the conduit only being three quarters inch, is there anything in the uh, in the way of an HDMI solution he can pull? through there so that the cables can still be inside the wall without having to open them back up again. Three quarter inch. Is actually that's... like not quite as wide as usually the plastic outside that's yeah. just outside of an HDMI plug. Mm -hmm. That's tough. Uh, yeah, there, there's not, I mean, it, it would be very hard to force this to run through there. Yeah, even I mean, with could... lube. Even yeah, with well, I was going to say, even with shaving off some of the plastic on the oh, sides man. and trying to get that plastic thing <laughs> off, you're just begging for trouble doing that. Uh, I mean, you could get, and this is going to be expensive, but you could get some sort of solution that's I, that's uh, optical. Yes. Then uh, run the optical cable through, then you have boxes on the other side. Usually you do that for oh, long runs. You were thinking that. I was thinking yeah. Monoprice actually offers a, uh, what, is the, what is the actual name of the Slimline? Is it Slimline? that they call it, uh, but their optical HDMI cable series. Okay. Um, they offer one that uses a smaller HDMI connector that then goes into a converter once you've pulled the wire through right. and turns it into a full-sized HDMI plug. Uh, I mean, it's meant exactly for this situation, and the cable is even plenum rated, so you can pull it through any type of conduit that you might have, even one that's acting as an air return, but full 4K 60, 18 gigabits per second, uh, even audio return channel works over this thing. So uh, that that could be a physical solution if you just want to buy an HDMI cable that you can pull through. Yeah, it's their Slim Run AV HDR optical okay. HDMI cable. Um, but 230 bucks. For, I know. for the 30 foot one $250 for the 50 foot one so clearly it's not the actual optical cable that's costing a lot uh, right. it's not an inexpensive solution but it could work <coughs> the other option would be to go HD base T okay. because then you're just pulling through uh, uh, an Ethernet, Ethernet cable, cable, which should right. definitely fit through a three-quarter inch conduit. Uh, now here, I'm thinking since you specifically mentioned she's using the built-in apps and that, uh, and I'm, you know, he's not entirely sure what future setup would be. You might want to make sure it's one that supports ARC, uh, because a lot of HD based T solutions do not support the audio return channel, but Emotiva's right. does. So Emotiva okay. sells one that you can buy three hundred dollars though. Jeez. Dude, for this amount of money, you could just pay somebody to run the stupid cable to in the wall and you're done. reopen the walls, exactly. Oh, yeah. it's a lot cheaper, yeah. So, but 300 bucks for Emotiva's HD based T solution. Again, uh, HDR support, uh, 4K. It's going to be hertz. more expensive than the mount he's asking us for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it could be. But then you're just pulling Ethernet through. So, yeah, I don't have a good low cost solution that you can pull through a three quarter inch conduit. Unfortunately, it's uh, oh, well over $200 either way that you go. It's cheaper to just pay somebody. Yeah. To, you, why don't you have them just put in a new conduit? That's right. That's what I would do. So is there any particular wall mount that we would recommend as especially good pick for the C8? Uh, there are lots of them out there. Uh, I'm sure Mother Price has some. I didn't look there. I looked at Chief and Sanus, and they both have options that oh, are yeah. but they're kind full of tilt. Yeah. They are. The, the full tilt, the one that just sits on the wall, I think is 100 bucks from Sanus okay. that I, I found. Uh there's, uh, I think the the one that tilts that just tilts is like 150, 170, and then mm -hmm. uh, if you want the full motion one, it's a lot more, three hundred dollars or something like that. Yeah, I, honestly, uh, so the OLEDs are not as heavy as a lot of other TVs. They're super thin in that. Now it's funny because if you pick up a C 8s like box, like the shipping box, you go, well, this thing's kind of heavy. Half of that weight is the tabletop stand. Uh, the tabletop stand in that thing is like a iron brick it's super it's made heavy. of lead yeah, it, it, it's really dense and heavy. superman can't see through it <laughs> so basically what i like half of that packaging weight is just the tabletop stand which of course you're not using on a wall mount uh the thing to be aware of with the oleds is that because all of the electronics are down at the bottom the visa mounting holes are also low on the tv they're not in the middle oh, okay. of the back of the tv like a lot are now that's not a problem um it'll still work with any standard visa mount so 
honestly, there isn't a reason I should point you to a particular one. Uh, I mean, you'll right. have to decide how much uh, movement do you want the mount to allow. And that's and that and that amounts that that basically translates into cost too. Yeah, directly. Yeah. So if you, if she's just going to stick it on the wall and leave it right there, mm -hmm. well, then you can get away with a pretty cheap. Yeah, you can get just a flush mount, which a flush mount. Any yeah. of them will wear. And she got the sixty-five inch size, so it's unlikely that any of them will be protruding in an ugly way. You will be, like I say, because the mounting holes are low down. Uh, it might seem a little weird that you're securing it to like the bottom of the visa mount rails but it's totally fine the weight of the tv is not enough to be a problem for any standard visa mount wall right. mount so go to monoprice or go to amazon uh get you know if you want one that uh rotates left to right one that tilts forward and back one that does all four or one that can even you know scissor out from the wall whatever you want all of these types are available just get the right type of movement and make sure it's standard visa and that'll be enough yeah. So Brett has visions of dual subwoofers and full size speakers at his mom's house. But his mom wants a sound bar. Shocking. Absolutely no one. Right. Uh, anyone, any recommendations? Well, I mean, how, first of all, how much does she want to spend on there that? There is that. Because, because uh, you know, if you're going high end, if you're going good sound, then you want Yamaha, the, their sound, uh, digital sound projectors. Oh, all the way uh, up there. Okay. Yeah. But if you aren't, then there's lots of options. And she may be wanting a very clean look, in which case she you're more yeah. you more worried about the 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 size of it and making sure it matches up yeah. very correctly. And doesn't RBH make one that's custom? Well, but it's a passive speaker bar though. You oh, still have to not... connect an AV receiver to uh, it. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so okay. it's it's three speakers in a sound bar like enclosure. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to point you to Yamaha here, uh, and I'm going to point you to their Bar 400. Also, interestingly, like also known as the YAS408, because I know you like that name because it's <coughs> Yas. But, yes. Uh, yes, Yamaha. Yes. Uh, but yeah, the Bar Hype. 400. Yep. <laughs> it goes for $500. So I don't know if that's more than you want to pay or not, uh, but it's got some really nice features to it. So the thing about the Bar 400 is it's part of the music cast system. I don't know if you're going to do any whole house audio, but if you want to, this will integrate right into it. Uh, on the back of it, it has keyhole mounts. So if you want to mount it directly to the wall itself, you can do that. Uh, they have an image, of course, on their website of a very clean installation. But to do that, you would have to poke some kind of hole in the wall because mm, you still need to get electrical anyway. power to it and you still need to get the signal to it somehow uh in addition as far as features go you can take any pair of music cast speakers and make them wireless actual surrounds so if you want to do a true 5.1 system you can do it with this bar by adding optionally wireless music cast speakers to it so that's another nice feature to it but what i might recommend to you since you're gonna have a tv wall mount anyway is you get some of the very inexpensive they're like 15 uh they're just like kind of shaped like an l and just the little brackets that attach to the same visa mounts on the television mount and then it just hangs either above or below the tv itself and holds the sp the sound bar for you above mm -hmm. or below and that gives you a little bit of this you know black l channel to also run the wires because we know you already have a recessed electrical outlet and all you're going to need to run is either an hdmi cable to the arc port or an optical cable uh one thing to know about the bar 400 is that it does only decode dolby digital and dts so you don't have to worry about atmos signals uh with it's not an atmos sound bar Right. But I don't think that's what we're looking for here anyway. So I like that one. It's good sound quality, $500. It's not super cheap, but not crazy expensive. Nice slim form factor. And you can optionally add actual surround speakers to it if you want to easily. And it, it has a little graphic on there where it basically it's Bluetooth. So you can connect yes. your Bluetooth headphones to it and then listen to your headphones. Oh, does it have out? Because, yeah, Yamaha is doing that on their AV receivers, which it, is... Uh, it does say it's that. Out. I mean, it does say that it's ah. got... It, head, it has a little image of headphones. Oh, so okay. I imagine that's got to be what it means. Yeah, I, so. um, I I sometimes keep forgetting to mention that. That's another thing people have been asking for from AV receivers and soundbars for a long time. They're like, I know I can put Bluetooth in from my phone, but can I send so, Bluetooth out to my headphones? <laughs> Yamaha is supporting that type of stuff now. He is it's asking nice for a clean it. installation. So yeah. I like the idea of the L brackets putting the speaker, whichever speaker you get, if it's this one or another one below yep. is is good and that therefore it moves with the tv it moves with the tv if you becomes the part of the tv That's and right. then it basically all your wires i mean every mount that you buy no matter what mount it is is going to have some way of basically a wire channel yep, it might just right. be a little plastic little hook or yep. whatever that you put the wires through and then you'll run the wires down through that conduit down to or back to the tv and as the case may be but yeah. down through the conduit so that you can go to your little subwoofer 
box that this thing comes with. Uh, this whatever. Oh well, the subwoofer box. is wirelessly connected to the soundbar, so. Oh, yeah. so you could do that wirelessly. That just needs as well. to plug into a wall. The, yeah. the, so, okay. like I say, you wanted this clean look. So e even if she wants to expand to full 5.1, all of that is wireless. You'll need an electrical outlet for the surround speakers and an electrical outlet for the, for the subwoofer, but all of those connections are wireless. So. I think that's good. I mean, if you really want to do Atmos, uh, I would point you to the Sony soundbars that have a similar right. thing, uh, similar offerings. Then those do Atmos and DTS-X, but now the price goes up to at least $600, uh, $900 for the one where you can yeah. add wireless surrounds to it. So quite a bit more expensive. So the problem with this thing is that it needs power. Sure. So she's got an electrical outlet back there, like a recessed electrical yeah, outlet behind the back TV. there. Yeah. As long as it's got two outlets, one for the TV, right. one for the sound bar, you'll be fine. Yeah. If it doesn't, you're going to be tempted to fish that wire down that three-quarter inch conduit. If oh, don't fits. do that. That's but illegal. But you, <laughs> that's illegal. You cannot do that. So you're you're in. You're back to whenever your electrician or you know wall person or comes in. That recessed outlet. You just get a little adapter that. Yeah, turns you're going to want an adapter or something. Two. That, yeah. yeah. All right, Patrick wants to know what cameras we use for our YouTube videos. I have a Logitech one that says HD 1080p, and I don't remember what else it says. I could find it. <laughs> That's very specific. I know. <laughs> uh, so on the completed versions of the videos uh, where we are split screen and side by side, uh, I'm using a Microsoft Cinema 720p. Uh, I hate it, uh, so don't get that. It's, it's not good. Uh, <laughs> and if you're watching the behind the scenes version, it's just the, uh, webcam that's built into my Dell laptop, which, um, surprisingly doesn't have as many problems as this Microsoft branded, uh, cinema 720 P HD. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's, that's what I'm using. I'm not sure. I don't know if he's asking because he thinks the quality is terrible or because he was looking for a recommendation. I'm not sure which direction he was coming from, but I do not recommend what I use. Uh, they're not showing it on here. Uh, uh, let's see here. Let me see if I can. I mean, this. I would probably point you to Logitech anyway. The only reason I didn't go Logitech is because there was like a month after one of the major Windows updates where like every Logitech webcam in existence was broken by Microsoft and uh, we needed to record. And I had previously a Logitech camera and it wasn't working. It got broken by that update. So I ran out and bought a Microsoft branded webcam thinking, oh, that'll work. And I mean, it functioned, but it's never been very good. So. <laughs> yeah, th they're not showing it, but it's like the C9 something. Okay. It's an old, older version. So there's on, on their website, there's a C930E, the C925E, the C922, the C920. Mine's closer, looks like it's closer to the 9, I don't know, 20 maybe. Okay. That that range. Anyways, it's it it, it, it was probably, a, it was over 100 bucks when I bought it. I think I got it reduced i think i got it on the sale but uh the it's an older version of one of those so it has like the it's a you know rectangle it's got the weird little thing where you can kind of clip it onto the top of your laptop monitor if you want to mm -hmm. the little thing and it's got speakers on the sides and it's a 1080p projector so i mean a projector camera and it's great it's fine it's, i've had no problems with it it's worked with everything uh, it's fine i actually have it mounted onto a little uh you know foot thing that attaches to my uh my tripod so mm -hmm. that I can not have to worry about hitting my computer and having it do things. So that's it. And then mine's fine. I like mine quite a bit. All right. M Miguel on Facebook, is there an audible difference between ro regular Dolby Digital and Dolby Digital Plus? Ooh. This is a big question. Uh, because yeah, this, is a, Dolby... this is a short, easy <clears throat> question with a not easy answer. <laughs> yes, because it, it, it depends on what the, where you're getting the Dolby Digital or the Dolby Digital Plus from. That's a big part of it. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean... It, you know, Dolby Digital and Dol like is what we you know like oh okay that that's what we got when we got DVDs right Dolby Digital right and then uh, when like uh, high you know Dolby uh, True HD came out all of a sudden they started talking about Dolby Digital Plus but Dolby Digital Plus was also coming streaming from you know uh, different uh, you know the cable networks and stuff we were getting. Dolby well, Digital and Dolby Digital No, I mean, Digital usually your Plus. cable network, anything HDTV is going to be regular Dolby Digital. But Dolby Digital Plus started showing up when we started getting internet streaming services, Netflix, and that right. particularly uses Dolby Digital Plus. So, you know, I mean, is there a audible difference? I mean, maybe? <laughs> Sometimes? Well, there can be. That's a, I mean, there can be. So, let 
maybe we'll, I'll try to break down because Dolby Digital Plus has some objectively obvious capabilities that Dolby, regular Dolby Digital can never do. Uh, it doesn't mean that that is what you're getting with everything that is using Dolby Digital Plus, but it is right. capable. So Dolby Digital, so vanilla Dolby Digital is limited to 5.1. Then there is also Dolby Digital EX, which matrixes in a sixth surround back channel into it. Rarely used, but a few DVDs had it. Uh, what was it like? Austin Powers 2, The Spy Who Shagged Me, had a Dolby Digital EX soundtrack on it. Really? Yep. Wow. I, I think one of, the, one of the Star Wars movies had it on there. Yep. Something like that. But yeah, that was Probably regular. Probably owned it at some point. I'll be honest with you. I think I've owned every <laughs> version of Star Wars that exists. That was regular Dolby Digital, and it had a maximum bit rate. I might get this number not exactly right, but I'm pretty sure it was 640 kilobits per second was the maximum bit rate for 5.1 Dolby Digital. And its compression uh, was basically equivalent in quality to MP3. Right? You sort of take mm. MP3 quality. It is lossy. What is fed into the Dolby Digital decoder, encoder, is not exactly what comes out of the decoder. Information is lost, and it's about as efficient as MP3. So that was Dolby Digital. Now, Dolby Digital Plus can uh, contain 7.1, so do regular Dolby Digital never could. Uh, Dolby Digital right. Plus can be discrete 7.1. It can also have Atmos extensions attached to it. So if you're listening to Atmos from Netflix... That is Dolby Digital Plus with an Atmos extension on it. It activates the Atmos decoder in your AV receiver, uh, but it is not lossless like what is on an Ultra HD Blu-ray disc. It is still lossy. You're still right. losing information, but you can have Atmos. You could never have Atmos attached to a vanilla Dolby Digital signal. So that is a clear and obvious objective difference between the two. But as far as sound quality goes, the thing about Dolby Digital Plus is that it can use a huge range of bit rates. It can use bit rates that are lower than original <laughs> Dolby Digital. It can also use bit rates that are much higher. I believe its maximum is 1.5 megabits per second. Right. Um, and its minimum is like way down. I think it's like, I think it's something like 128 kilobits per second for all seven channels, like divided. <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that it's more advanced uh encoding than like mp3 or dolby digital it's it's more highly efficient in its encoding and therefore the reason that streaming services like it so much is that they can actually send a lower bit rate than vanilla dolby digital would have been with supposedly the exact same fidelity and quality but using less data. So that's attractive to streaming services. They're not usually delivering a higher bit rate and higher quality. HD DVD use Dolby Digital Plus a lot at a higher bit rate than vanilla Dolby Digital to deliver quality that was really close to full lossless true HD. Right. That was the format that HD DVD favored was Dolby Digital Plus, but at a high bit rate. But what, what we're mostly seeing when we see Dolby Digital Plus today is from streaming services at a bit rate that's actually lower than what vanilla Dolby Digital would have been. So... <laughs> Is it do, is there an audible difference? Well, there could be, but not yeah. necessarily. It depends on what they've chosen to do with it. Yeah, it's and not they're... a clean cut answer. Yeah. All right, let's go on, Carl. Oh, okay. What, I, I, <laughs> You're you know, we could do, we could talk about that forever, and I don't want to talk about it anymore. No, no it's, just, it's it's a complicated thing that I wanted to try and unpack. But yeah, I, 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 so Dolby Digital Plus is newer. Dolby yes. Digital is like a set bit rate, basically, is the way you. Think I mean, it's about somewhat it. variable too. Like DVDs were like 384 kilobits per second, but it could right. have been 640. Like the super bit ones that Sony put out, they use the full 640 kilobits per second. Then I have like super bit Fifth Element and super bit yeah. Charlie's Angels. And did it did it sound drastically different? Uh, really hard yeah. to tell. Yeah. More, they were usually were encoded in DTS, right. so They've got that you as know, well, yeah. you know, I, the, you got a lot more bass out of it, so. <laughs> You know, is that because of the bit rate? No. Nope. That's no. a choice in the mastering. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Carl. What are responses to the questions posed by Jerry Del Coliano? Coliano, whatever. I think. Yeah. yeah. From Home Theater Review in his article, my thoughts uh, our thoughts on my first commercial movie theater experience in fifteen years. First of all. Oh, you're so cool. You haven't been to oh, movies I know. in fifteen years. Wow. How I don't have that, a television at uh, all. Oh. My hey. When I married my wife, she had a television at home, and she didn't turn it on, and it was bigger than mine. So, 
she's got that beat. I only uh, read Russian novels. I'm in so Russian. Good. That's right. Let's get the original flavor. <laughs> uh, it was. I skimmed this article. It was yeah. a little pretentious, but it's just of fine. Course. I mean, is this what it is? Uh, you know, he's, he lives apparently in the world's richest city. I'm like, how much does this guy get paid to write these things? I mean, I can't. I, Probably not I'm enough, not, which is why he had to come up with this article so that he could make a little bit more money. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> anyway, so he asked, what gets a, uh, what gets you out of your home theater and into the commercial cinema? Because apparently what got this guy out is it was raining or something. And yeah. he had to take his kids to the Lego movie. Yeah. Lego Movie 2, which yes, he said was not two. as good as Lego Movie 1. I haven't seen Lego Movie 2. I'm not sure. I don't know either. I thought Lego Movie 1 was fine. Yeah. Uh, what gets me out of the home theater into commercial cinema? Very little these days. Mm. Uh, very little. Uh, it's Usually it's because I want to go... It's a Star Wars movies and Star Wars movie. Everybody's into it. And it's sort of a, 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 you know, a family thing that we do. Mm-hmm. The other reason I've been to the movies... Lately, is it's been uh, Wonder Woman, Black Panther, and Deadpool. Those were the last three okay. movies I saw in the theater on purpose, and and not like I accidentally saw some, but that <laughs> I purposefully went to the movies to see them, and it was all to basically say I want to support this type of movie right. being made more often, and right. that was why I did that. So that being said, I can't. F- anymore see any reason to go to a movie and see a movie in the movie theater like hmm. like i've already supported like the you know women director women whatever all that stuff i got i did that i already s- supported the r-rated you know superhero movie just to <laughs> say that i've done that uh yeah i just you know i already saw black panther to support that type of movie being made with you know, you know minority groups be giving getting their fair share in the in the spotlight i want to make sure that movie made money yeah not just roles but like you know writing and directing the whole thing you know i mean roles is one thing and that was really important too but i felt like that that backside of it was just as important people behind the camera because there's yeah the the people behind the camera they really you know that's a whole bunch of white people most of the time (laughs) so you know i thought that that was important to support but at this point i'm like i'm not saying that i won't support you know, Black Panther 2 or whatever, but I'll probably support it by getting Disney Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Disney Plus, yep. I, I hate to say that. Uh, I mean, I like going to the movies, so it, I, I mostly go to the, the big blockbuster ones, the ones that people are chatting about online, and I like to go on opening night, and that way I, I see it with a crowd who's there to watch the movie, and they're into right. it, and it's a fun experience, and it doesn't take a whole lot to get me out of my home theater <coughs> and into a commercial cinema for that type of thing. I enjoy it. I think it's fun there yeah and rob pays like 25 to you know yeah 40 about 25 bucks. bucks for a seat and i so i can get i don't really like d box uh i hate that anytime right. there's a horse you bounce up and down like a little horsey ride so i'm not super into d box but i like having two armrests so i pay for the d box seat but i go to the movies <laughs> and if i at the very least i'm taking i gotta take somebody with me right so i don't know who that somebody is but somebody in this family has to go with me so that doubles the price if i take the entire yeah. family we're talking 150 bucks exactly to get into a, a movie difference. theater, and uh, that's before it's really well, the hundred and twenty or so. It was last time I looked at the tickets. It was the the, the convenience fee yes. was insane. Yeah. I'm like, it's a third of the price of me going to the movies for me to order the tickets online. You guys have lost your minds. Yep. What is wrong? I could just ugh. anyway. So I I've really shied away from going to movie theaters anymore because of that. Um, you know, and, and really before this, before I decided to go to the movies because I wanted to support specific mo- movies, uh, the last movie I think I saw in the theater uh, was the first Avengers movie. No, the sure. second Avengers movie. The, the, okay, so the two Avengers movies, and then I saw... One of the Star Wars. I know you saw one of the Star Wars. Oh, the Star Wars movies. I'm not really counting them because that was sort of a Christmas present okay. sort of thing for the family. So those <laughs> were just just something to do, just something to give the kids, you know, and it, it was you know, sucking up but my parents. Part of this question is like, is, is any of it to do with the actual audio video experience of it? Because for me, it's not like I have better bass at home, even than the giant theaters. I'm lucky. I live just outside of Vancouver. It's a big city. We have tons of cineplexes <coughs> and I have lots of choice for good quality theaters. I'm not sacrificing on video and audio quality for me to go out to the commercial movie theater. Uh, yeah. But I'm also not getting a huge, 
gain. I mean, the the experience of the gigantic screen and sitting in a much bigger auditorium, that is different than what I get at home. But honestly, the experience that I have watching an OLED with my full surround sound system is superior on some technical levels outside of just sheer size. So, right. but I'm, I don't feel a huge sacrifice either direction. So for me, that's not the deciding factor. For me, it's almost purely social. That's the reason. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, going on opening night is always fun. Like I've yeah. seen when I was in college, I saw a ton of movies on opening night, yeah. you know, going to see the first Mortal Kombat movie yeah. on opening night was a blast. People were like, you know, just having a great time. Exactly. But I, and just I don't generally... get that by myself in my home theater. So right. That's, right. Yeah. But, uh, at my age with, you know, kids and expenses to worry about, and, you know, scheduling to deal with, I generally can't do that. And, you know, I, I certainly don't have the funds to do it. So that's why I don't. And frankly, I don't know that I've experienced better picture quality right. or, you know, significantly better picture quality sure and certainly not better Cin audio. I want, I want a Dolby Cinema to open somewhere in the Vancouver area. Come on. Yeah. <sighs> So he says, with a uh, Amazon, Netflix, Apple, and other streaming server, uh, video serve, uh, providers all getting into, uh, into original content, and including feature film releases, you know, Bird Box, that was fantastic. How excited are we at the prospect of day-to-day -day releases that are available both in theaters and at home at the same time, on at the same release day? Man, I could care less. People have been talking about this for ages. I'm like... It just, I just don't care. I don't I really don't see it happening. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It, it doesn't make sense from the studio's perspective, for yeah. sure. Yeah, you know, uh, and the it windows doesn't... are getting so short now. It's like, what are you even complaining <coughs> about me. anymore? You know, I honestly, I mean, uh, Aquaman, which I feel like was just in theaters right. like two two weeks ago, is at Redbox right now. Yeah, and and it was uh, on streaming weeks ago. Yeah, if and you I wanted it. Yeah, if I wanted it, right? And I, I just don't, I don't care that much. I'll wait. You know, I'll wait. Yeah, for it to come out, and I'm fine. I'm with I'm not, that. I'm not, I don't, I'm not worried about the day and date thing. People keep saying this, but I'm like. I just it doesn't it doesn't really factor into me. I'm like I I don't want movie theaters to disappear entirely. I don't want that. I want movie theaters to exist, and I don't see how it is really feasible if if everyone could easily get any movie at a low price at home on release day. I think that would hurt theaters. You know. Oh, it would it, definitely it, it, it would kill theaters. One hundred percent kill theaters. Kill them. So I don't I, mind having release windows where this movie is available in this format for this amount of time, and then it will be made in, available in other formats after that. I don't have a problem with release windows. Yeah. Okay. So selfishly, if I look at it from a selfish perspective, yes, I would like everything to be released at the same time. All you people who want to go to the theater and can go to the theater, I'll pay whatever I pay to get it and watch it at home. Mm -hmm. I'll be happy. You'll be happy. Everybody be happy. But the reality is that that would 100% kill theaters because if it's in it, it's it, either it's too expensive for me to get at home and then I'm not going to do it or it's exp it, it works and nobody's going to go to the theaters. Right. <laughs> The, I would prefer that, you know, I guess unselfishly, I would say I have no problems with there being a 30, 45, 60 day period where it's only the, your only chance of watching it was in the theater. Yeah. Then you go that. Therefore, you've got people who give given the option are going to watch it at home yep. on their TV speakers. Yep. You know, with a, you know, with a, the, 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 the torch mode you know on and and just looking terrible i'd rather them go to the theaters and have a good experience <laughs> and then later on say call us and say you know I, I i've got this tv and i'd like to have a experience like i have at the movie theaters how do i do that tom and rob and we help them that's kind of my unselfish because i would like them to still have that experience that i am going to have at home for sure right i and i'm willing to wait a little while, while so we can keep an industry that's been around for you know a, you know, over a hundred years, keep them around, you know, keep them around to have, you know, that give other people that same experience. So I'm, I'm okay with the way it is. I, I don't really care. And I, that's <laughs> just, you know, I, I'm good at keeping myself away from spoilers. I'm good at, uh, you know, not, uh, uh, you know, not doing too much research into things. And I'm fine with waiting for, you know, end game to come out. Yep. So. I, I get, I'll tell you what, 
It'll be on Disney Plus. <laughs> when it gets on, if I get Disney Plus and Avengers Endgame comes out, I'm not going to stream it before I buy the the Ultra HD Blu-ray. Okay, I'm I'm just not going to because I'm going to want to see it with the best sound and the best right, right, picture, right. and I'm going to want to see it that way before I see it the other way. I'll tell you the which... rest of the movies I'm going to be okay with, like Ant Man versus Wasp or whatever, whatever that stupid movie was called. I will never need to own that movie. Oh, never. I like that movie. I like that man of the Wasp. But uh, no, I'm going to be ticked off if Disney has done all this and I'm feeling very compelled to like, to quite possibly get it, even though I begrudgingly will do so. But if they don't offer any Atmos at all, I'm going to be like, you, you bastards. <laughs> you look like you and five other people are going to say that. Gonna, and I'm going to be like, one of them. I'm going to be like, you you're know. so close. You're so darn close. You're doing 4K and HDR, probably even Dolby Vision. Uh, uh, like you're going to probably do all that and then you're, probably going to stick us with like 5.1 or who knows maybe there'll be like so many other services and be like stereo audio only when we get done with this question remind me to talk about the audio from the xbox okay because I've, I've kind of figured it out so how much would we be truly willing to pay for day and date hollywood blockbusters via some sort of home delivery service uh prima attempted to offer such a service via a thirty thousand dollar home server and movies priced at five hundred dollars each studio still wouldn't support it and now those thirty thousand dollar servers are useless but there's talk of negotiations with studios wanting something closer to a thousand dollars per movie jerry says he'd pay a hundred bucks what's our number uh this is just again this is something that doesn't really make sense uh for the studios to ever do and no. the reason being is that the minute that you uh, offer it at any price somebody's going to monetize it Mm. And they're going to make money off of it. They're going to... Which there was know, all rent. this all this stuff attached to that Prima service that they had. And I mean, people are like, $500 or $1,000 per movie, but, but they were delivering like literally the same digital cinema package as what's being sent to the theaters. That was yeah. the idea, that here's yeah. what the theaters are showing and you're getting the exact <coughs> same thing at home. This Obviously, this was targeted at millionaires. You know, this wasn't yeah, 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 yeah. a normal consumer market. But there has been this... I mean, there's been several things floated around, ideas of services where you could somehow get day and date releases you watch this stuff at home i mean again same thing i'm not i don't mind release windows i don't mind them being exclusive to the theaters for 45 days that's fine in my book um, but look at look at rob and my all right a hundred dollars yeah. for rob is for a day and date release right. it's like a, a lot, lot of, of money that's making sense for him he can pay 25 bucks and well, i could pay a lot yeah. less if i wanted than that. right <laughs> and uh for me i'm like a hundred bucks that's a deal Sure. Because now I, yeah. you know, I don't have to buy five total That's tickets right. plus convenience fee and everything right. else. So there is no perfect number for this. So right. I'm, you know, uh, it, honestly, we got to. It's one of those things where why are we still talking about it? Well, the other thing it's, is, it's never going to happen. Like I look at my okay, I spend twenty five dollars usually for a D box seat, and I'm like, if this isn't a movie that I really want to see on opening night with a crowd, twenty five dollars can usually get me the disc later too. So to me, the right. price of a movie, and this is why I don't feel a need to pirate because I'm like, if I'm going to see it in the theater, it's going to cost me about about twenty five bucks. If I'm going to buy it and own it, it's going to cost me about twenty five bucks. So a movie to me costs about twenty five bucks. Uh, right. So if I guess twenty five dollars is my number because that's my number for everything else. I don't think that's ever going to be offered, so I'm not worried no. about it. No. All right. On a different tact, uh, Bang and Olufsen announced their Bio Vision. I wish they would stop naming things that Bio Vision Harmony OLED TV design. With the, when the TV is off, the OLED panel is lowered very close to the floor, and two aluminum and oak wood panels, which house the speakers, cover most of the TV screen. Okay, when you turn it on, the OLED panel rises, and the two panels swing downward, like the wings of a butterfly opening, is how it's described. Yes. To reveal the TV screen and position the speaker panels below it. It's their take on camouflaging the TV when it's not in use. What do we think? I think it's dumb. I, I, I am not super, a fan of this thing at all. I'm like, they, dumb. they clearly got a look at LG's rollable OLED, <laughs> and they're like, well, we can't do that <laughs> so we have a big black rectangle and we're gonna i mean these it doesn't panels, even this, don't even hide the whole screen oh, i know you when can, it's closed i'm like what what is that how is that an attractive thing this is now a useless tv with these like couple of wooden slats in front of part of it i don't get this at all this is bizarre you, to me you ever see like some you know like like in a uh, you know where the wild things are and stuff in you know books like that where you see a monster trying to hide behind a tree that's what this looks like <laughs> yes, yes. it looks like the tv's like it's, you can't see me it's sticking you can't out see all me over the place. i mean i would much rather just like on the oled uh lg oleds you can just put it in gallery mode where it just shows artwork 
right? Yeah. Uh, Samsung has their version where it can either just show artwork or you can actually take an <coughs> image of the wall that's behind the TV and then it will show that to like camouflage itself. I'm Why like, would you even want to do that? It just I don't. It, but I would, I would it, take like either. I really want burn in. I want burn in of my wallpaper. I would take either of those things over over this. I mean, this is purely about oh, it's motorized and isn't it neat to see this thing move around and that. But honestly, the closed form factor is highly unattractive to me. And so that can you it use the speakers in that form factor, or know. is it just is it just off? I don't know. Because if they if you can use the speakers, the speakers are now. I don't know where the tweeters would be on these things, but yeah. they've got to be where because they go from like. Uh, yeah, they'd be at the tops the of top. the closed panels right. versus the outsides of the <laughs> open panels, which I'm sure is where they are. Yeah, uh, I mean, is this going to be significantly less expensive than LG's rollable OLED? Because I don't think it is. Yeah, and this is this is this is coming from Bang & Olsen, so I'm like the rollable OLED wins. If you want, if you want a TV that hides, then the rollable OLED wins. It's just. Whatever. Xbox I mean, Audio, what's going on with that? Oh, okay. So uh, Netflix says Atmos no matter what, it seems. Okay. And Atmos, uh, it, it works the way it used to work. Where As far as I can tell, side surrounds come out the back. Oh, yeah. Again, yeah. I think so. So when the, when the content itself is 5.1, which most of Netflix is. Right then okay so you're not getting sounds out of the overhead speakers even though your av receiver says atmos on the front panel because as far as it's unless concerned, unless it's the atmos signal. unless the, the it's getting an actual atmos signal and then it works right yeah if you get it because there are there's a, but there's only a handful of things on netflix that are actual atmos and now most of the other content be it uh uh hulu or youtube or whatever it's saying 7.1 channel in okay and that seems to be working correctly okay so I'm getting five points, you know, with the yeah, side yeah. surrounds. So I'm not 100% sure about the Netflix and Atmos thing because I haven't been watching a lot of that. But I know my side surrounds when I'm watching Amazon Prime because I've been watching The Expanse, mm -hmm. which, boy, lip sync is like all over the place. Like mm -hmm. I it, I figured if you start and stop it a couple of times, you can get it pretty close. Mm -hmm. But never exactly right on which is hilarious when there's a fight scene because like the punches are just a little bit off and you're like oh she's not even close to that dude because you know it, you, the sound doesn't match up but i'm definitely getting side surrounds on the side surrounds and nothing out of the surround backs okay so with with that so se seems like we're getting closer i don't All know right. that I, that they're matrixing anything overhead and the, well, I that, that, that isn't released yet. I mean, that's still in, in preview for insiders <laughs> and that. So we'll have to look forward for that because then you can finally just say, okay, output Atmos. Your AV receiver will always say Atmos, but when the content itself is not Atmos, the Xbox will be up mixing it using the Dolby Surround up mixer inside of itself. And you'll just, you'll have sound coming out of all your speakers all the time, no matter what the original content was. We'll look forward to that. Just in time for them to come out with a new Xbox. Of and course. Screw it up again. All right. <laughs> I'm really trying to get through this question so that I can go put a cough drop in my mouth yes. and so that Rob can answer the question while I go and <laughs> cough myself to death in the other room. Greg. Greg currently has a 7.2 set up in his family room and he would like to expand to Atmos, but unlike positioning uh, his 7's floor speaker, so he only gets one shot at cutting holes in the ceiling. He played around a lot with the placement of his 7 speakers before getting them where he thinks they sound best, so he's concerned that he might not like the results right away when he adds his four overhead speakers. Mm -hmm. Dude, that might be the case even if you do play around with them because this is what we're talking about. But what whatevs. Hype. The dimensions of the family room are about 19 by 21 by 10 and a half. And there's a uh, half wall at the back with a 19 by 15 foot kitchen on the other side. He's added a ton of wall and floor treatments to address all the hard surfaces. He says the results are, quote, not bad, unquote. But he still thinks there's room for improvement on the acoustics front. It probably is, and you're never going to get a good it's an one, open. So it's an open building. room, essentially. Yeah, you got a it's half fine. wall back there, but uh, the sound waves don't go, oh, half wall, I better stop here. No, they, they go Ooh. right through that opening. Yeah. How am I going to get over this wall? He's got a 65-inch Samsung QLED for casual viewing, a 120-inch screen that rolls down in front of the flat panel for movie time. He's running a pair of 18-inch Velodyne subs. His seven speakers are all Martin Logan Electrostatic ATF Advanced 10 Film. Oh, thin is. film, that should be, yeah. Sorry. It says 10. I know it says 10, that's a typo. Yeah. 
the Vance Thin Film Transducer Speakers, including the very large electrostatic CLS to Z front left and right, the curved electrostatic logo center close to the floor below the screen, and the tower form factor mosaic speakers that side surrounds and surround backs, which he's managed to position so they're just above ear level, level when these things down. Adcom amplifiers power the speakers. He said, would we still say that separate amps are needed in his setup uh, like we say to pretty much everyone else? These are Martin Logan's. So these are power. Aren't, so just to, aren't, just to yeah. specify that. <clears throat> yeah, that we say that separate amps aren't needed in his setup like we say to pretty much everyone else. Martin Logan's tend to be pretty power hungry. So Also, those CLS2Zs in their specifications warn that they dip down to 2.3 ohms yeah. and even mention specifically that they do so at a very high frequency, which is oh, right. unusual. Usually the, the low impedance part of a, <laughs> a speaker's uh, impedance graph tends to be in lower frequencies, but they, they specifically mention because they know this could be a problem for amplifiers, that it's a right. really low impedance at a very high frequency you would never want to attach these to a class d amplifier that would really struggle to drive these and yeah you're in a large space with difficult to drive electrostatic speakers you are a person who needs external amplifiers and you have them those ad right. that he has are tremendously beefy and now, up to the task so yeah. you could probably make the case that the surrounds and surrounds backs depending on how far away they are from your couch might not need them maybe yeah, uh, and those aren't actually electrostats. Those are a different yeah. design from Martin Logan using these advanced thin film transducers, so kind of a, a planar type of transducer yeah. that they're using. In so, there. I mean, really, when they... Okay, so your main speakers, probably no matter where how close you're sitting to them, mm. you'd probably want to have external amplification yep. because of how hard they are to drive, how difficult of a load they present to an amplifier. Yeah. But with most other speakers, no matter how hard they are to drive, they or how power hungry they are getting them close enough means that they don't require a lot of power to get loud which means you could probably not have external amplification generally speaking but in your case certainly for your front three speakers i would have suggested uh amplification and depending on where your surrounds are I may have suggested it or may yeah. not have. I mean, this is why there is there is no one size fits all advice, and it's yeah. why we answer each question individually because it is case by case. We have to take things based on room size, listening distance, exactly what speakers are yeah. being used, and this is a case where we're like, "Yup, you need external amplifiers at least for those well, speakers." Well, if you had come to me with your plan for uh, your home theater beforehand mm -hmm. and had said, "You know, do I need external amplification?" My first question would have been do you need those martin logans <laughs> you know because the martin logans do need external amplification if you don't need the martin logans then you don't need an amp external amplification right. you can save a lot of money yeah i mean but if, if you, you had going i'm using jtr speakers that, right you know put out 105 decibels with one watt and right. i'm going to be 15 feet away from them but still <laughs> you know the different different case <laughs> entirely yeah right so it was recommended to him to use Martin Logan Helos 20 or Helos 22 in-ceiling speaker model for his four overhead speakers. The Helos 10 or Helos 12, I don't understand what's going on here, is more traditional looking in-ceiling speaker with a single tweeter in the middle of a woofer. But the Helos 20 has two tweeters. It can be run as a stereo signal being played by a single speaker. But it can also be run as a mono speaker with two tweeters being used to create a wider dispersion. So what do we think of that advice in this uh, and the somewhat unusual design choice. All right. So I wonder, so he said he's played a lot with setup before he was happy. And that's why he's worried about these overhead speakers. Yes. Okay. I'm wondering how much of that playing was with those front two speakers, the left and rights, mm -hmm. and how much of it was with all the rest of the speakers that aren't quite as uh, electrostatic. Well, it seems like quite a bit of it. Sorry, we're having audio dropouts here again. Um, okay. Else. Are you hearing me, Tom? I did hear. I heard you up until that last little bit. You said audio dropouts, and then you dropped out. Yep, which is yep, ironic. That's going on. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, it seems like he did do some playing around with the surrounds and the surround backs because he, you know, fiddled with getting their height exactly where he wanted them to be and that type of thing as right. well. So, yeah, he's right. done a lot of adjustment here. I, I think the advice makes a lot of sense because Martin Logan speakers in general, and this even applies to their in ceiling speakers, they don't go for wide dispersion. The electrostats certainly do not. They are like almost focused, like <laughs> not not right. exactly laser beams but they are quite focused you have to be sort of within the boundaries of the panel to get them sounding exactly way that electrostatics are meant to sound so they're 
in ceiling speakers as well, even though they aren't using like electrostatic panel, because I don't know how you do that in an in ceiling speaker, but they still go for a narrow dispersion. So Atmos speakers are supposed to have really wide dispersion. And I'm sure he went to his Martin Logan dealer where he got his other right. speakers. And they're like, for Atmos, we recommend these ones, even though they have these two tweeters firing off. And, you know, usually they're meant as a stereo, a stereo signal being played by a single speaker. They're like, they do have this mode where you can use those two tweeters to create wide dispersion. And we recommend those for Atmos. I'm like, that makes sense to me because otherwise you'd have narrow dispersion out of your in-ceiling speakers. And you don't want that for Atmos. Yeah, but I'm wondering if he really needs to have Martin Logan speakers on the ceiling. Oh, I, mean, I, I know see. he probably wants them, but because everything else is Martin Logan in this right. house, and that that would be fine. But you know, if you're running external amplification anyways, and you know, I don't know what he's using for a pre-pro or a, or a receiver, but uh, you know, the, the ceilings are only ten and a half feet tall. You know, they're, it's not like a humongous you know room, and. At most speakers are supposed to be diffused. They're, they have a pretty wide range of where you put them, as far as location in front or behind you, or you know, you know, they have some some wiggle room there. I, you know, placement for me, I think, is less of an issue with Atmos speakers because they're not supposed to be pinpoint accurate. Right. You know, you're 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 going for a more wide dispersion. So, do you need to have Martin? I'm going to go right back to you. you. Need to spend all this money for Martin Logan speakers. <laughs> I mean, if you really want to, then I think Rob's right. Going with the 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 wired dispersion speaker makes sense because we need as wide a dispersion as we can because they're supposed to be firing straight down, and you're supposed to be sitting off axis to them, and you want there to be not a weird you know sound because off axis response of these speakers are not as good as it, as you would expect for an in ceiling speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, I'm mm -hmm. in agreement with all of that. Um I mean, I would say if you if you're just like, yeah, they're going to be Martin Logans, that's what I'm getting. I go, "Well, I do think the advice you got was correct. I think this is the right yeah. the right way to go as opposed to the ones that'll have much more narrow dispersion." So, yeah, either it's you, you give up on the idea that they're all going to be matching Martin Logan and you go with with something else or this is the right way to go if it is martin logan right and going with something else i would think would be fine mm -hmm. i mean these are atmos speakers there's lots of options out there that you could go with that i think would be okay so he's read dolby's white paper on atmos speaker placement first of all some of the information has changed or been adjusted from year to year so is it safe to assume that precise atmos speaker placement is not set in stone and there's actually some wiggle room well if you've read it then you know there's wiggle room because it's a it's a you know from like 30 you know what is it like 30 degrees to 30 to 55 you know, 50, yep. yeah 30 yeah. to 55 elevation angles so yeah, you've got uh, you've got some play, some wiggle so, room there yeah yeah there is there is some wiggle room absolutely uh within within those ranges that Dolby themselves specify uh yeah that pretty much answers that one because the next one on is with his real question yeah so he could mostly follow Dolby's current guidelines of putting top front and top rear speakers at 45 degree elevation angles and between uh, 0.5 and 0.7 of the widths of his room apart and more or less the same distance apart as his front left and right speakers. But the top le uh, left top rear speaker can't it can't quite be at that exact location due to an obstruction on the ceiling. So how far can you stray from the guidelines before it becomes an audible problem? Uh, I mean, are you going to stray outside of 50 deg 55 degrees or 30 degrees? Because that's where I would start worrying about it. Exactly. You're, yeah, probably, gonna, still, you're probably gonna be there. Can you still be within the ranges <coughs> offered by Dolby? It seems. I'm trying to imagine a scenario <laughs> where you're. Rear... Well, I, I would just make the, the 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 rear ones match. So if if they're at 40 yes. degrees, then have them 40 degrees on both sides. If they're that's at, right. you know 50 degrees, have them 50 degrees on both sides. I I really don't think other than that I would worry much about it. Yeah, sorry, we're having such audio drop. I don't know if it's my side or your side. That's I don't know, dude. I I was I hadn't noticed it until Doing just recent, just 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 a couple seconds ago. It's on my end that you're just freezing up, and I'm not hearing you. But yeah, uh, so sorry for the disjointed uh, talking between the two of us. We are having technical issues in the background here. But um, yeah, can you stay within the guy? If it's a matter of you can get the 45 degree elevation angle, but if you do that, it's going to mean that say your top. Uh, top rear on the left hand side has to be like cl closer in or farther out if that's the obstruction um, I would sooner say can I have them at the widths apart that I want them but I have to move them back a little bit more you know they're still going to be within the, the 30 right. to 55 range but I have to move them back a little bit more or forward a little bit more I can't have them at 45 and that width apart I have to have them at 35 and that width apart I would sooner do that than have 
you know, one of them that's three feet to your right and then the other one is like directly over your left seat because that's what right. you have to do to keep them both at 45 degree elevation. I would try to keep the widths the same and then maybe move it back or forward as necessary. That's I 100% agree. That's exactly what I would do. I would not... I'd, I'd be moving them front and back, not yes. side to side. Yeah. So if that makes sense. So he asked, have we done any experimentation with various overhead speaker placements? Can we elaborate on the different overhead positions and combinations to make sure he puts them in the best locations possible? I think we've kind of already answered this. We have not. I mean, I haven't. Well, I'm I've sure done. you have. I've done. Yeah, I've done the experimenting. Yeah. All right. So tell, tell us. Then. I uh, have determined that you really want to have a pair somewhere a little ways in front of you and another pair somewhere a little ways behind you. <coughs> to me, that delivers the best of the Atmos experience. Uh, because you do want to be able to essentially move objects left to right and front to back overhead. And it's difficult to do that if your speakers are not in front and behind of you at least a little bit. Now, that's not saying that if you have determined that you have top middles and front heights, so you don't have a you know top rears, something that's actually behind you, that that's delivering a horrible experience or something like that. It's nothing along those lines. I'm saying he's he wants to do this once. I'm saying the optimal position that I have found is essentially what Dolby recommends, <laughs> top fronts and top rears. That's what I would go for, if at all possible. Right. So yes, can we talk some more about why we don't think Atmos speakers should be angled so that they are aimed more directly at the listening position? Why are we okay with being so far off axis? I mean, why are you okay with your center speaker being in the center? Okay. I mean, you are the center speaker is meant to be in the center and it's meant to be pointed at you because that's what the that's how they mix for right. the center speaker. Okay. At most speakers are supposed to be, you know, where the different positions they're supposed to be at, they're supposed to be pointed straight down, and you're supposed to be sitting if they're front if they're not overheads, even if they are overheads, you're you're still off access to them because you'll be to the left or right side of them. It, that's the way that they are mixed for. That's the way that they are designed to work. So then when Dolby set up Atmos, this was the whole idea. You know, it, it's unreasonable to assume that people are going to be able to angle their overhead speakers at their faces. That's just not a reasonable expectation for people to be able to do. In ceiling speakers fire straight down. That's just the way that they are. So therefore, Dolby and DTS, when they mix for these things, they are mixing with that in mind. And you know, overhead speakers generally have very wide dispersion because they're meant to be overhead. They're meant to be firing straight down and people are meant to be off access for them. Yeah, so Dolby themselves have even said as well that if you do buy uh, in-ceiling or on-ceiling speakers that have narrow dispersion, that they are okay with you angling those somewhat so that you are within the dispersion window of the speaker that you're using. This is why they want you to use really wide dispersion speakers and right. then just have them fire straight down, but you're still gonna be within the window of the dispersion because <coughs> they have such wide dispersion if you use the type of speakers that they recommend. They're like, we realize not everyone is gonna do that or they already have something installed and they don't wanna replace them. And if those have narrower dispersion, then yes, aim them towards the listening area so that you're within the window of the dispersion. So that's, I mean, it's not really any different from surround speakers. You sure. want to be within the window of dispersion of the speaker. If that requires you to do some aiming because they have narrow dispersion, then so be it. Dolby's in agreement with that. So we're just going along with what Dolby says. That's that's the advice that we're passing along. Right. So he's using Ecornus? Ecornus, yeah. Ecornus, stressless recliners for a seating. One of the reasons he likes them is because they're very open and even with the headrest in position, it's easy to get a clear line of sight from the surround and surround back speakers to your ears without the chair itself obstructing the sound. Why don't we talk more about this factor uh, more often? He's had different seating and it made a huge difference. I'm going to emphasize that word. When the seats aren't so large and don't block so much sound. So shouldn't that be a higher priority worth mentioning on a regular basis? Oh, so I looked up the seating. They're like fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a seat. Yes, they are. They are very pricey. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you, if you were to look them up, you would go, "I've seen this before." Oh yes. You know, they kind of, they kind of look like the Herman Miller type chairs. You know, they have like you know whatever, and they're my um, you know my mother in law had one that was very similar to this. It was a recliner. It's a very comfortable. You know, recliner, and they sometimes they have like separate ottoman thingies that go with it, and sometimes they recline. They're they're super pricey, and do I okay? He has been experimenting with this. I I take umbrage, or I I I want to 
say that I'm not 100% sure that a huge difference is made by having chairs that are, you know, obstructing a little bit, you know, your your ears from hearing what's going on behind you or to the side of you. There, There's only so much your ears can hear. I mean, you know what else is obstructing what's happening behind you is your actual earlobe. It's in the way. So there's a little bit of that going on as well. So we have talked about it before on this podcast, but the reality is people usually have a very limited number of chairing or seating options. And most of us are looking for something that we can afford and that has we have available to us. So we can't always be so choosy as to say, oh, you absolutely need to have a chair where it's unobstructed. I mean, we've seen this before in audiophile rooms where they'll have these mm-hmm. massive speakers, you know, glass walls on every side, you know, <laughs> and no room treatments except for a little clever little clock in the back of the room. And it's a wooden, you know, purgatorial looking chair yep. <laughs> that they're supposed to be sitting on so that the sound can come at them Sometimes unobstructed. even just a stool with no back because even That's that right. would be too much. And I, I'm sorry, there's, I, I'm going to sit and watch a movie for two hours. I am not picking the chair based on whether or not my ears are unencumbered to <laughs> the speakers. I'm picking on whether or not my butt is going to be able to sit in it for two and a half hours while I'm trying to watch Aquaman. And why is Aquaman two and a half hours? I have no <laughs> idea why that movie should be two and a half hours. What is this? You know, but I have to sit there for, you know, two plus hours. I want to be comfortable. And that's why I'm buying a chair. I'm not buying it for audio. Sorry. I mean, I am in full agreement of having a clear line of sight. Right? We have definitely mentioned that on a regular basis, saying that we want you to have a clear line of sight. Uh, if that requires uh, a little bit of finagling with the positioning of your speakers because you bought ones with a high back or a wide back or something like that, then that's sort of the way that we've addressed that, is this idea that we want a clear line of sight. Uh, I'm not in disagreement that, you know, if really tip-top audio Uh, is a huge priority to you and you have the budget to do it that yes give consideration to the seating that you're in as well Uh, you know Gene over at Audioholics made that recommendation it's one of the reasons he went with the particular model of continental seating that he went with because it has this sort of protrusion for the headrest that's quite narrow and Mm. makes it easier for sound to reach your ears as opposed to a you know a really wide tall headrest so yes that that consideration is given there it is something we could potentially mention more often but I'm agreeing with Tom that I'm focused more on comfort i'm focused more on price i'm focused more on style because those are the things that people are usually looking for in seating and i want you to have a clear line of sight but i'm willing to move the speakers more than alter the seats that i'm buying to get well there. i mean most home theater seating is going to cost you around 500 dollars a chair at a minimum yeah i mean that that's that's where the the price point starts right. and getting up to 1500 to 2000 dollars a chair mm-hmm. is a huge difference that's plus said, these are these are standalone chairs yeah. that don't you know, flow well together in a theater setting. Yeah. So there's other options. That said, there's there other, certainly uh, are many theater recliners, dedicated theater recliners with the cup holders and all that, that are up in that $1,500 you know, yep. per chair price range. And then some of them do have really high, cushy, wide seat backs that I'm sure are very comfortable, but would be a challenge for the audio. So I get coming from that direction as well. All right, Alfred. His last name does not start with a P. Would be it awesome. is not Pennyworth. Yeah. Alfred has his home theater in the 15 by 13 by 8 room. He sits about 8 feet from his front speakers. He's got a single SVS PB13 Ultra Sub because Overkill is his middle name. <laughs> and he doesn't have a room for a second one. He didn't have room for the first one, but he made it work. He only really cares about his seat, so it seems to be fine as far as the base goes. His surrounds and surround backs. Why on God's green earth does he have sound around backs? Anyways, his surround and surround backs are RSL CG4. His front speakers are Polk LSI series, all powered by an Outlaw 7125, which is seven channels by 125 watts per channel. Mm-hmm. He likes to listen loud, and he's loved his bedroom system for 12, the 12 years he's had it. But does find his front speakers to be a bit fatiguing. He would... So he would upgrade into SVS Ultra Series speakers for his front three B worthwhile. He'd even he'd like even better imaging and clarity if he can get it, but mostly uh, about being able to keep the volume high without getting fatiguing. What do we think? <coughs> Excuse me. I think that there's literally no speaker in the world that can't get loud in this room at this distance. So um, <laughs> with this amplification, so loud is not your issue. Clarity is your issue, mm-hmm. and distortion is your issue. Yep. I believe that going loud with these polks, uh, God help me for getting slammed by all the polk lovers out there, 
they're probably the tweeter is probably distorting it may even be the mid-range distortion. i mean the lsi is also an interesting design because those use that ring radiator tweeter which right. is really beamy it's, it's, right that's one of the the characteristics of that tweeter is that it beams a lot so if you have yeah i mean you kind of have to aim those ones right at you you can't be very far off axis before you clearly notice a difference between on axis and on <coughs> off axis they have narrow dispersion they beam a lot so if you have them basically aimed right at you which you very well might uh it is very easy for that to get quite fatiguing because it is an extended strong treble that's coming out you like a beam <laughs> and it, right. it is not super surprising to me that you've experienced some fatigue with those speakers they sound very vivid they have very right. strong detail if you're in that narrow I've, dispersion range. But, yeah, uh, I've enjoyed ring radar raiders. I've only can, seen yeah. one. I've only had one speaker uh, on my test bench, if you want to say it that mm -hmm. way, that had a ring radar, and I thought that was fine. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I don't listen to extreme volumes though for right. extreme for long periods of time. Uh, would the ultra series speakers uh, be worthwhile? I mean, I mean, they'd be I, different. They'd be different. They'd definitely be different. I would worry less about. I mean. It's it's when you say I like to listen at very loud volumes, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, and I and I'm getting fatigue. Well, I mean, you're gonna very loud volumes is fatiguing. I mean, it's just well, there's that as well, yeah. There, there's that to be to consider. I don't know how much I can blame on the speaker and how much I can mm -hmm. blame on the volume. On just there's, being loud a lot, yeah. There's there's that to consider. So mm -hmm. will that be the case? I mean, I probably. I mean, they would be different and they would yeah. probably i would be less concerned about fatigue but i can't guarantee that at any any speaker is going to be non-fatiguing if you're listening at lot for long yeah. periods of time at long, at loud volumes i mean my take here is that we i i would definitely expect it to sound different <coughs> from your current speakers and svs has free two-way shipping yeah, so that's another thing to consider. Why yeah. not just give it a try uh because i mean if this were potentially going to cost you money out of pocket i'd be less eager to say do this but i'm like right. i don't see any reason to not try it because even just for the experience of going these are the speakers i've been listening to for 12 years it doesn't hurt to just literally hear anything that's a bit yeah. different and the svs ultras are no slouches and if they happen to be really to your liking well great you keep them and if not you send them back and you are not out a penny out of pocket so where's the downside right uh you know what i'm gonna recommend is uh Get the Aperians too, because they're also too free to a shipping. Well, no, actually, I think that this guy might end up on a speaker hunt. Yep. So Which rather was a than theme last week, yeah, was, rather than going to SVS and ordering speakers and having to ship them and ship them back and everything else, I would consider going to like Best Buy Magnolia, oh, okay. and and saying, you know, I want to try some speakers out at home. I will pay you for them, and then you know, I want to bring them back. And what you're trying to do is to find out when you put a, a quality speaker, I, I, I honestly do not care what it is. Mm -hmm. it, 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 I don't care how up, far outside your budget is or how under your budget is or whatever, but get something that, you know, we've talked about before on this, this podcast, you know, Focals, uh, Kefs would be good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that they might have there, even Klipsch, you know, yeah. high, you know, the, the higher end Klipsch would oh, the, be great. The new JBLs with the design of those, I like a lot. So, so yeah. just get something new bring it home a b it with your current speakers mm -hmm. and you know with the with the idea is i'm not keeping these i'm taking mm -hmm. them home i'm going to listen to them and then i'm going to take them back and then if you if you bring them home and you listen to them you're like wow that was different and you know i think i liked it or i think it, it, it made me think that there is something out there that i might like right. better than what i currently have then you go on the speaker hunt if you bring home something that's like you know about at your price point and you're like eh nah i really like mine the best like definitively hands down then i don't think i would go down this road i mean you could order the svs's but yeah. i'm thinking this is this is to me think, saying to you let's try to make this as painless as possible you go to best buy you take some speakers home you listen to them for a couple hours you go back to best buy and you say here i want a refund and then you're done I guess. Rather than having having to go through the whole SVS thing, you could do it both ways, yeah. or either way, or both at the same time. It really doesn't matter. I mean, to be but, I'm fine with going SVS and Aperion because free two way shipping, and I I don't have any qualms taking advantage right. of that. So, yeah, it's up to you. Let us know what you decide to do. I'd be I'd be interested because I really think that what's going to end up happening is you're going to get the S, the, the SVSs. You're going to listen and say, 
wow, I like these. I wonder if I'm going to like anything else. Mm -hmm. And then here we go. And then, you know, it's going to be, you know, Varus Grands and the yep. you'll be looking at I the, mean the Varus uh, Grands uh, do have that tweeter with really low distortion you drive it really hard and it refuses to distort so that might be yeah. right up your alley might be right up your alley and then you're going to be looking at well, what about planar magnetic maybe I'd like mm -hmm. that yeah okay here we go Sierra 2's welcome welcome aboard the Rob train you know hype so okay Infinite Gary what's our opinion on the ideal ambient noise level I love Gary's questions <laughs> just Love him. Gary's dedicated theater is extremely quiet. And he's got lots of acoustic treatments, both absorption and diffusion. The various setups that he has in other rooms of his house are not dedicated theater, so their ambient noise levels are higher. And the rooms are nowhere near as heavy, heavily treated. He gets excellent fidelity soundstage and imaging in his theater, but if he is being honest, he wouldn't want to only ever listen to things in his theater. He's got all of his other setups uh, because sometimes it just feels more comfortable to listen in a normal room. So is it possible that a highly soundproofed, highly treated room isn't actually ideal, just as far as listener comfort goes? Would it be possible to maintain the same level of clarity and fidelity in a room that weren't so quiet? Objectively, no. Right. Objectively, that isn't you. Objectively, that is noise is always masking low-level right. detail. So, yes. just objectively, it is it is not the case that you want to have some sort of ambient noise in order to make things more, you know, mm. you know and it still have the same fidelity. It's right. just not the case. Now, you put me in a heavily soundproofed room for more than a couple, two or three hours, and I am like, okay, I would like to get out of here because mm -hmm. I feel, you know, it feels, it, it doesn't actually always feel normal. Yeah, to a be in really a room like well that. soundproofed, really heavily treated room yeah. uh, is unusual. Yeah. <laughs> that is that is rare. We go to the yeah. effort of doing it in order to retrieve that really low level detail that is otherwise masked by pretty I, much any normal room. But it is an odd experience. It's not normal to us. <laughs> when you when you listen to you know a movie or you watch a movie or something like that, and it there's it goes to a very quiet point, mm -hmm. a very quiet point, and then there's a noise. Mm -hmm. You know where you know you're watching the character on the screen and they're about to say something. You can see that they're about to say something, and then there's a noise. No matter how slight that noise is, it's distracting. Right. It takes you out of that moment. So, yes. I mean, I just think objectively it is false that we want to have ambient noise to make things more, you know, comfortable or whatever. But sometimes it's more comfortable to be in a room with ambient noise because mm. it sounds more normal. It is so what we're used to. Yep. That That's fine. I mean, you can enjoy, enjoy both those things. But objectively, it is false to say that there is some level of ambient noise that would be the best. Mm, yeah, I mean, I have to be in a bit of agreement. I don't think I would want to listen to everything I ever listened to in yeah. my life in a really qu super quiet, damped room. That would Oh, be God, help fun. me if I ever had to listen to Pandora in here. Yeah. It's awful. You're like, oh, my crap. It sounds terrible. In my car, it is great. It's fine. That's I right. love Pandora in my car. I'm singing along. I'm having a great time. You put Pandora on in my home theater, I'm like, I can't listen to this garbage. This is terrible. This sounds awful. It's like food, man. We don't want the same thing all the time. Even if what we're having is terrific, yeah. we don't necessarily want it all the time. So be thankful yeah. you have multiple setups, Gary. That sounds ideal for you. Kevin, back in 2013, I was an audioholics, in an audioholics video from either CD or CES. You couldn't remember exactly which one, yeah. I think it was CES, but I don't remember. Mm. It might have been CD. Where I got to demo the DefTech Mythos STL Super Towers. Ever since then, Kevin has wanted to get a pair, but the price has always been out of reach. He's got a situation where they're very slim... Uh, form factor is what he wants but he also needs high output capabilities and this pair are going to be used on their own without a sub so even though kevin knows that it might not be the most uniform base he still wants as much base extension as possible from the speakers themselves and these super towers have their own powered base drivers to help them on that front so accessories for less has some very limited stock but at their price of two grand instead of the regular five grand for a pair kevin can definitely afford them so should he snap them up I'm dying here, dude. I, I struggled to get through that without coughing. Oh, my God. I need some water. I feel like what I'm coughing trooper. up blood. Um, I remember demoing the speakers. I wasn't the only one in the room. I remember uh, demoing those speakers, and yeah, they were fine. Uh, they're very slim. They're very <laughs> they're slim. Very they slim. Have... They're like the stick form figure uh, factor that, like, a lot of, um, say, Sony or Samsung home theater in a boxes have, like, yeah. stick speakers. These are bigger than those super skinny sticks, but they're definitely, like, especially front to back, much smaller than most gigantic towers. Right. So, I mean, 
first of all, the answer to the question is yes. If you've always wanted them and they're in your price point, you should buy them. Well, it's just the thing of he he hasn't experienced them himself, so he's relying upon sort of your having heard them and knowing knowing that the that form was like, factor is right like for him. Seven, eight, nine years ago. Yeah. I mean, I I don't remember, man. I mean, I'm sure they sounded fine. But your but impression wasn't said. always stay away. <laughs> no, no, my, my pre- and, and very rarely is it. Yeah. Uh, the only time I've ever heard a demo that was stay away was Tanoi. That mm-hmm. was the only one that I've ever heard mm-hmm. at any place where I was like, and Bang of the Olfson speakers when I was there, they sounded great too. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can make those things happen, but uh, yeah, these were fine. And if this is something that you really want, then you should give them a you should give them a go. I don't know what accessories for less's return policy is. Five percent restocking but, fee if you send them back, and you you do have to pay for shipping. So, so that's a hundred bucks. It is hundred bucks plus shipping. It is not yeah. free, but uh, yeah, no. I mean, the thing is, so the the question obviously is, is there an alternative that's like cheaper and better for sure, or something like that? And honestly, I don't know of one. Uh, other, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I mean, a golden year would have exactly yeah. the uh, the other company I would be looking at. But they're going to be uh, more expensive than these. Not not at the normal five thousand dollar a pair price. That wouldn't be the case. But at this discounted two thousand dollars for the pair price, if you went golden ear, they have nice slim narrow towers that can play very loud and can right. extend deep without a subwoofer they they tick all those boxes but they'd be more expensive so there's not a tremendous reason to do that i and still then, don't think these things are going that deep though i mean they can't go that deep what is their well i mean yeah I well they claim up. to go down to they, they claim frequency response at 14 hertz which of course is meaningless it just you know, right I'm, that just means i'm sure the, maybe something dr- is moving at that the point. driver is moving at 14 i, I hertz. don't know what they the do. negative three decibel point is but well regardless you're not going to have uniform base anyway because these aren't going to be properly positioned for that but he's just thinking like you know the clear alternative if you want something with a small footprint well you could just put a bookshelf speaker on a stand but that's not going to have this type of look to it of course right the, right. the footprint might be about the same because these have outriggers but the look is going to be different and then you're probably not going to have the base extension although i'm less concerned about that and a lot of bookshelves have great base extension on them uh but i mean my overall my my too long didn't read answer to this is i think this is a fine choice. I don't have a reason to tell you, do not get these. Uh, they're now yeah. at a price point that you can't afford. They have the form factor you want. They tick all the boxes. And I can't <coughs> point you to a really great alternative that would cost less. Um, you know, Polk has some really skinny speakers, but I don't think they sound that great. So I wouldn't right. be pointing you there. Uh, Paradigm and Revel have some really skinny speakers, but they'd be more expensive than these at the And these are not, price. I mean, these are skinny, but they're not like... A yeah. stick. Yeah. I mean, they're still wide enough. A lot of to... it is the front to back, though, because most uh, sometimes you have narrow towers, but they're really deep. But right. these aren't that. So, no, I, I think this is a pretty, I'd give you a thumbs up on this purchase. Knock yourself out, too. Alvin. Alvin has the upgrade bug, and he's thinking, bug. Uh, and yep. he's thinking AV receiver. He's currently using a Denon uh, 1612 with 7.2 con- speaker con- configuration. He could definitely use more HDMI inputs, dual HDMI outputs, feed both his flat panel and projector with an upward splitter, and the ability to convert analog uh, video from his old game systems to HDMI, which would clean up some of the wires and please his wife. Mm-hmm. First of all, dude, you, I hope that the resolution of your TV and your projector are the same so that we don't have to go down that They are, yes. He's, so far, that's been all right. <clears throat> the price is the factor. And he's thinking that if he upgraded his receiver anyway, he'd like to try Atmos. The thing is, we always seem to be recommended having four overhead speakers as opposed to being uh, 5.2.2, but the 5.2.4 models are more expensive, mm-hmm. which is true of everything. More features, more expensive. He can comfortably afford the top S series model in Dennis Lightup. It offers all the HDMI features he wants, but tops out at 5.2.2. And it has mod- Odyssey Multi EQ instead of Multi EQ XT, let alone XT32. The lowest X series model uh, is right around the same price. That would get him a uh, multi. EQXT, but loses analog video to HDMI conversion and doesn't have dual HDMI outputs or as many inputs and also still limited to 5.2.2. So he asks, is multi-EQ XT a big enough difference over regular multi-EQ that he should sacrifice all those HDMI ports? This is a uh, a question that is a different answer for you than it is for me. Mm. And for me, XT32 uh, or, you know, XT over multi-Q was what I was looking for. Like, that was the definitive fact, the uh, feature that I was looking for. And I did not look at any other receivers that did not have multi-Q XT. I wasn't interested. 
uh, and that's when I purchased my own receiver. I mean, I want, this is not, you know, me getting a free one and saying, oh, just give me the best one. No, this is me purchasing. I XT was, I would not consider it. Now, you have other considerations, and your considerations are analog to video, uh, analog to digital uh, conversion for mm -hmm. your uh, sources, so that you can get some wires out of there, and uh, having enough HDMI inputs. Yes, those are more important to you than than uh, the level of honesty that you get. And frankly, I got no problems with that. If those are the definitive factors that you're looking for, along with price, then you get the best one you can that have those two features mm -hmm. at the lowest price point you know that that you can find so if that's the top s level then that's the one that you should right. go with yeah i'm in agreement with all that and i would further say before we had the odyssey editor app i was <coughs> not super keen on regular mult eq because previously there was no way to prevent it from eqing high frequencies Right. And it doesn't have enough filters to do a good job of that, in my opinion. There were a lot of people when MultiQ originally came out who said, I don't necessarily like the results of this. And I had to agree with them because it was EQing all the way up to 20 kilohertz and didn't really have enough filters to do a, a really great job of that. XT came along, drastically increased the number of filters. And now I was okay with it EQing all the way up to 20 kilohertz. I thought it did a pretty good job and XT32 does even better. But now that you can use the Odyssey editor app to turn off high frequency equalization, like you can say how high the equalization goes and then just doesn't try to equalize above that point. Right. Now it's a case where you can go in there, turn that off, and at least you're not doing damage to your sound. You might not be improving it because you're not equalizing at all, but you're not doing damage to your sound, which prior, I was like, you could actually make this worse by using multi -Q. That's my opinion of it, but I was sort of coming at it that way. So I'm, I, I'm definitely agreeing, like, you've got to get the HDMI features. That's the whole reason you're even considering this, HDMI, uh, this right. AV receiver upgrade. And since... Multi-Q doesn't have to be applied in a way that might do damage to your sound. I'm much more okay with it. So yeah, should he hold off on all this until he can afford a 5.2.4 model, or is 5.2.2 still a worthwhile taste? Hmm. Uh, this is... Can we just skip Atmos? <laughs> can we just not do Atmos? Because I, I honestly well, I mean, think even that... Even if you just stick with 7.2, that is Atmos. It doesn't have it's overheads, a type of Atmos. but you yeah. get objects in the floor layer if they happen to be mixed that way. I, I mean, I, I think... I mean, if your wife is already... If it would make your wife happy to have less wires mm. behind your receiver, I don't see how putting more wires on your ceiling are going to make things <laughs> any better in your life. I mean... I guess you could go upward firing. Don't do that. Don't but do I that. guess you could. You could. I uh, I would honestly just stick with 7.2. Yeah, it's 7 a big one. price difference because the ones he's looking at are right around $300. Yeah. And then to go to 5.2.4... Now, I mean, you could get 5.2.4 by jumping over to Onkyo and going with their 787. And you can get one of those for right around five hundred dollars. <laughs> Still, clearly more expensive, but right. not an astronomical difference. I mean, the least expensive five point two point four in Denon and Marantz's lineups are about seven hundred and fifty from ex accessories for less. So that's that's a big price. <laughs> I mean, it's more yeah. than double the price of what you're looking at, which would definitely mean you're saving up if what you have to spend right now is about three hundred bucks. Uh, I mean, the I'm, thing is, if you get yeah. say the S nine thirty or S nine forty. Right, which has all the HDMI features you want, but is limited to 5.2.2. I mean, you could try it because um, it's there. You can right. also just keep 7.2 as you have, which is what we would recommend. I think, I mean, it is kind of a taste as in I've never had any speakers above me before. Does it do anything up there? Um, I guess I'm okay with that. I, I mean, if you're going to do Atmos, I want you to have four overheads. I haven't changed that advice. But it's like, you can get everything you want at the price you want. We're not really worried about Atmos. Just stick to 7.2. But since you can, go ahead and give it a try. And then you go, oh, okay, I tried it. Right. There. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I would just skip it. I'll be honest with you. I'll, I'll, I, I would just not, bliss, I would not even worry about it. 7.2 is just fine. I would skip it. I would not even worry about And your receiver will it. still say Atmos even when you do that. So you can feel That's good right. about that. All right, Damien. Damien's got a pair of SVS, SB12, and SD subwoofers. Uh, his room is not a dedicated theater and isn't acoustically treated, It's a sm but it's small and enclosed. So we talked him off the ledge a while back when he was worried that maybe his subwoofers don't have enough output. 
We said to focus on positioning, calibrating his dual subs, and to that end, he got that calibrated. You, Mike, one from Cross Spectrum Labs. Go, Herb, hype! Mm -hmm. And downloaded Ruby Q Wizard on our advice. When he started listening to bass sweeps, he could hear an obvious dipper in around 45 hertz. He measured the response of his two subs playing together as main listening position and got the following graph. This graph looks like a V-neck shirt. <laughs> yep. <laughs> At 45 hertz, it goes down about a billion db is it 50 no i mean 20 that looks like a partially smoothed graph so it probably dips even more than what yeah. the thing is showing but it's yeah. going from 90 hertz down to 60 hertz <laughs> 60 fr yeah 60 not his hertz uh 60 db Decibel, 90 yeah. 90 db down to 65 db that's the highest point at 30 yeah. at, at 30 at hertz best, that's what's yeah. going on at 30 at 30 hertz it's at 90 db at uh, 45, 45 hertz, it's at almost 65 dB. Yeah. That's a slight swing in volume. We would call that <laughs> I mean, a minor pra difference. It's practically a notch. He could hear it. He's like, he played a sweep, <coughs> and he's like, yeah, there's something missing at 45 hertz, yeah. and the measurements agree. <laughs> yeah. So that seemed to confirm what he, what he heard. It didn't seem to. It <laughs> flat out did. Let's not seem about it. It also eases his fears about uh, his sealed subwoofer not having enough extension because they extended it down to past 20. Yeah, I mean, they're, but, they look like they're minus 4 dB at 20 versus the average, Yeah, which yeah. Uh, you're doing just fine. So moving the subs to different locations required uh, would require wireless kits. So without physically moving his two subs at all, he measured them individually and discovered that they were not actually level matched. Mm -hmm. So he did that. And then he tried flipping the polarity on just one of them, measured uh, together from his main listening position again, and got the following. Now this graph still has a dip at uh, 45. But there is. It went from having 90 dB at 30 hertz <laughs> And 65 dB at 45 to 90 dB at 30 hertz, and now 82. About 82, I would say, yeah. at at uh, 45. So, so the difference is significant just in moving the sub. I'm well, just not sorry, moving flipping the, the flip, flipping the polarity switch and level match, and having them properly level match. Yes, we went yeah. from a, a difference of about 30 decibels to a difference of about eight. That is that right. is significant and definitely audible. So it's not a ruler flat line, but it looks considerably better, right? If that's a question, the answer is clearly yes. It looks better. It looks much better, yes. So, much better. So, would altering the placement of his two subs offer further improvements? He'll need wireless kits if he moves a sub, so which kits would we recommend? The answer is probably yes. Yeah. I would say almost definitely yes, depending on where, you have, where your options are to move them to. But uh, generally speaking, yes. If you can move your subs to better placements meaning mirrored locations across the room from each other then yes you should get better results than this yeah uh but the thing is he's only been measuring at his main listening position right now so we don't <coughs> we don't know i mean he might have he might have done measurements at other locate other seating locations as well right uh we don't know he sent these graphs from his main listing position so the it's tricky because we're not just looking for linearity right we're looking for uniformity which... So let's let, let, let let's let's just let's back it up here. Mm -hmm. Let's pretend that this is a, a graph that looks exactly the same at all of his seats. It's not the okay. case. It's not the case. But because he's got a reflective room with no room treatment, so he already said that. Sure. So we are we are sure every seat's going to look quite a bit different. Let's pretend that's not the case. And the case is that he's got this sort of uniformity in, in each seat. Damn. Well, what we could do is we could take down the volume on you know hertz 25 through well about 25 through 40 yeah centered so on that, 30 hertz there yeah yeah center on 30 hertz take those down until you know basically you get a flatter line around 85 db mm -hmm. right then you don't do anything at 45 because you can't do anything at 45 because it's a the more you boost it the more it's going to cancel itself out we cut down 52 a little bit so that's a little bit flatter and now you have almost a completely you know a very yeah. flat-ish line that's like a with two a two band eq <laughs> yeah a two band eq basically knocks out two of your biggest problems and makes your 45 dip into a minus two db swing yeah. barely which is audible you play a sweep barely game, audible hardly ever going to hear that yeah right but the case is, is that each one of your chairs is going to be different because mm. you have no room treatments. You have no ability. Your subs are not optimally placed. And we're pretty sure every seat's going to be different, which means that where it's a 45 dip at this seat, 
you move over and it's a, it could be a 45 D, you know, 45 hertz hump That's at right. that seat, which means that your EQ that you could do is either going to make that seat, the, the seat next to you way worse or yep. the seat you're sitting in way worse. If you knock down the 45 on, for the seat next to you, suddenly your minus 35 dB <laughs> dip is now going to be even worse next you know, in your main seat. So we, what you need, if you can get wireless sub kits so that you can optimally place your mm. subs so that you get more even base across each one of the seats, then you can get an EQ the parts that are that are uniform from seat to seat. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really what the repositioning of subwoofers is more about. Because honestly, if you if you truly <coughs> only care about this one seat, the main listening position, you could take the response that you've already achieved, and that is not a ton of equalization you need to do no. at that one no. seat. Now, it's it not. might cause problems in other parts of your room, although we're only talking about reducing a couple of small humps at this point, so the chances right. of that having a negative effect elsewhere in the room is really low, because we're not right. talking about trying to boost anything, right? But... If what you want is better uniformity across more than just this one seat, then you are most likely going to have to reposition your subs. So if the only way to do that is with a wireless kit, we're talking about subwoofer frequencies here. I don't think there's any need to overspend. You're in a small room where there shouldn't be a problem for the strength of the wireless signal. So I'll point you to the Dayton ones that you can get from Parts Express because they're nice and inexpensive and it's totally fine and you can get uh so you get a package that is one transmitter and one receiver you're most likely going to need two receivers but the transmitter and receiver combo is just under sixty dollars and then an additional receiver for the second sub is only 30 bucks so it's 100 bucks all in less than 100 bucks all in for two receivers one transmitter uh parts express dayton audio wave link is what it's called so running AccuEQ on his Onkyo was no help, which surprises no one. <laughs> After filling with the face knobs on the subs, uh, and that only seemed to make things worse, not better. So he intends to upgrade his AV receiver in the not-too-distant future, so should he stop where he's at and not worry about it until he gets his new receiver, or would getting a mini DSP right now be worth it? I would first reposition your subs sure. into optimal placement. Uh, I don't think that Accu EQ is going to do much, uh, especially if you're taking multiple measurements. Which I don't know if that thing does that. Does that? Uh, even do I, th that? I think the six four six is old enough that it's still the original version of Accu EQ that only took one measurement right. position, so it's not going to do much help. And if it, if what it's if it sees this big dip at forty five, <laughs> all it's going to do is pump more energy into forty five, oh, and and it's not. <laughs> you're right. You should notice no difference because the more you more energy you put Except into it, the maybe more elsewhere in the out. room where now you've made a hump even bigger, and that could yeah, be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do I think running getting a mini DSP right now would be worth it? No, because we're uh, because of the answer to your next question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, right now, I don't think that DSPs are your answer. Proper placement, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, the answer to your next question, and then we worry about EQ. So yeah, his next question, of course, is would acoustic treatments help? And the answer is, oh hell yes. <laughs> Although not at the lowest base, but the lowest base isn't where you seem to be having problems. Right. So it's at 45 hertz is your big issue right uh, now. Acoustic treatments at 45 hertz isn't going to do a whole lot either. But he's also got a, a, a drop off from like 60, 50, 60 55, on, yeah. Yeah, 55, 60, and there, 55 there down. you could be getting some help from bass traps. Yes. Yeah. So putting some you know proper placement. Adding bass traps, adding just room treatments in general in here, and then adding. Remember, EQ is the cherry on top of the. That's uh, the, the way I audio. like to think of it. All right. Yep. You know, it. You know, you get good subwoofers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your ice cream, right? You get room treatments. That's your whipped cream and sprinkles. You get your EQ, and that's your cherry on top. We can't. Uh, you can't EQ a really bad room. Mm. It, it. It just doesn't. It's unlikely. I mean, you'd have to be super lucky to <laughs> to have it work for you. So, uh, good subs and good placements, some room treatments, and then we EQ. So agreed. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't be telling you to get a mini DSP right now. Not that it's ever a, a super bad thing to have in your tool bag, but given that you're probably going to get a new, AV, a new AV receiver in the not too distant future, that very well might have all the equalization you need without a mini DSP, and focus on those other things first. And yeah, 
no need to go spending a hundred dollars that you might not end up needing at all in the not too distant right. future. He asks, is it better to adjust the gain knobs on the subs or the trim level in the AV receiver? Uh, there's I mean, technically there's it should be six of one half dozen of another. Generally speaking, if uh, the trim level on your receiver is automatically setting itself to like negative ten or something <laughs> like that, I would adjust the volume level. I like to keep the volume level around so that my my AV receiver is plus or minus two dB yep. from zero, and that just gives you some headroom on both sides, mm -hmm. uh, and also allows you to. Uh, to know that the signal that's coming out of your AV receiver will be strong enough to trip the automatic, hey, play this stuff on your subwoofer. Yeah, I like to try and get it so that the trim level in the AV receiver is fairly close to its default middle zero position, whatever that is. Yeah, you know, plus or minus a few dB. I'm not going to worry about that at all, but sort of around its default zero position. And then that therefore I am adjusting the volume knobs on the backs of my sub uh, as necessary to make that happen. All right, last question. Robert would like to make his own demo disc. He wants to be able to select individual scenes from Blu-rays and Ultra uh, HD Blu-ray discs that he owns and edit those scenes together into his own custom demo disc while retaining full audio and video quality formats. Can we recommend any software that allow him to do this? It's uh, tougher than you might be thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, generally, sp I mean, generally speaking, once, especially if you're going to put a single disc together, you don't want the resolution to change or anything to really change from one scene to the next no you know that that can cause all sorts of issues with your you right know, if it's switching between hdr 10 and then dolby vision and yeah. then no hdr at all and... yeah you want it to all be mastered basically at the same level mm. so that you're not you know you can't say oh this is my master commander you know scene uh, for my dvd and then i've got a blu-ray scene from i guess you, you could know. do separate discs right you can say here's my 1080p sdr disc here's my 4k hdr 10 disc here's my 4k dolby vision disc sure that would that would work that would work but but doing uh, it yeah so yeah. so okay so first of all these are i'm assuming retail movie discs which we must say you are never supposed to break the encryption on in any way uh so there that's legally covered like that uh there's a program called make mkv i'm sure you've heard of that that is your easiest way to have some kind of file on a hard drive that came off the disc now can you directly edit that mkv file uh quite possibly i'm not certain so the easy answer is if you end up using a piece of video editing software that doesn't work directly with the MKV file that was created by MakeMKV, you can put that MKV file into Handbrake and you can still end up with a standard MPEG-4, you know, AVC, mm H.264 -hmm. or H.265 file that will still have the full quality and the full uh, audio formats retained within it so make mkv and handbrake can in some combination get you to a file that you will then be able to edit so what kind of editing software do you need that can still retain all of the 4k and the hdr and the lossless audio it's possible that some other softwares do this i am not certain that they do so the one that i know for sure can do what you want to do is avid uh, Avid's Media Composer can definitely retain Atmos, it can definitely do DTSX, and it can definitely do 4K in HDR formats. Uh, as far as I know, it's not cheap. <laughs> Avid is professional software. There are different levels of Media Composer. You have to be sure that you get one that can use all the plugins for Atmos and DTSX and all the rest of it. Right. So I'm not super familiar with all of that. I, I can't tell you off the top of my head exactly which version you need and how much it'll cost. I just know that Avid Media Composer can do what you are wanting to do, but expect I to pay a pretty good price on it. Wasn't there, it doesn't AVS Forum, and I hate to send people there, don't they have like a group that does this, that puts together demo discs and then allows you to download it and... i mean there, i know there are definitely people who have put together demo discs yeah so um yeah which i'm sure are people who have access to professional video software which is right, why they right. can do this like I, I don't know if adobe premiere pro can do it it can it can do the 4k hdr video stuff I, the part i'm not certain about is the audio side of things i don't know if premiere pro does atmos and dts x whereas i know avid does so that's why i'm right. saying that um yeah, this this could be more than you were 
bargaining for, <laughs> Robert? I, I think it it might be. Because if you were just thinking, oh, I can just get a MP4 file and chop it up and put it together and there, there's my disc. I'm like, it's not quite yeah, that Yeah, it's not simple. like GarageBand. You know, yeah. It's not like just, just grabbing scenes and putting them together. It doesn't quite work that way. No, it's not that simple when you're dealing with yeah. these uh, immersive audio formats and that. So... Yeah, uh, I I didn't think of the AVS thing, so I don't have a thread to point you to right here on the podcast. I can see if I can quickly Google that or something, or you can Google it yourself once you're over right. at AVS Forum. But uh, usually, yeah. usually with those things, you end up having to download a huge file and then burning it, burn it to a Blu-ray or Ultra yeah. HD Blu-ray or whatever. And even that's not easy. I mean that that process is enough that people pay. I'm other guessing people this do it is for more them. than Robert was really was really bargaining. For. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but do ha, go head on over to avid.com and have a look at their various uh, media composer options and and it. You it can has usually find like online THX demo discs and t and <laughs> you know you know DTS demo discs and stuff. I mean the other thing CES. is it would be cheaper and easier to put together a Plex media server where granted you aren't just immediately going from scene to scene that you want. But the interesting thing is if you're playing, like let's say you're using an NVIDIA <coughs> shield to play it back, with your voice, you can tell it to go to the exact time that you want in mm. anything that you're playing back in Plex. I'm like, if you just have a list where you can literally just read in your voice into the little NVIDIA shield microphone, go to this time, uh, that might be a whole lot easier than trying to edit together your own a physical disc. All right. Well, good luck with that, Robert. Let us know what you do. All right. That's it. That's all of our questions. And we went long because Rob tricked me. I started yep. early and I forgot I started early. And now it's two hours and 15 minutes into this bad boy. I, I stayed yeah. silent and that was my trick. And also I blame Google for so many dropouts where I was just like, right. is Tom still talking? I have no idea. All right. All right. So uh, if you want your question answered on this podcast, just give us an email at question at avrant.com. If you want to support the podcast, uh, you can become a, a Patreon at patreon.com slash avrantpodcast or go to www.avrant.com and click on the buy us a cup of coffee link. Anything else, Rob? I believe that is everything. All right. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Mandry. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. I will try to cough less next time. <laughs> Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.